all the business of war. Indeed, all the business of life is the endeavor to find out what you do not know by what you do. That I call guessing what's at the other side of the hill. The Other Side of the Hill, two linked plays by Peter Luke, based on his novel, which follows Arthur Wellesley, first Duke of Wellington, and the men and women in his life, through his campaign in the Iberian Peninsula. With Michael Pennington as Wellington, John Moffat as Major William Napier, Dominic Rickards as Harry Smith, Philip Sully as Don Julian Sanchez, June Tobin as Madre Soledad, and Cyril Jenkins as Juanita de los Dolores. In 1807, Napoleon invaded Spain and Portugal and put his brother, Joseph, on the Spanish throne. At the request of the loyal people of those two countries, Britain sent an army to Portugal, which soon came under the command of General Wellington. For five years, from 1808 to 1813, Wellington fought the French back and forth across the whole peninsula, until in 1814, he finally succeeded in pushing them over the Pyrenees into their own country. Part one of The Other Side of the Hill, It's a Long Way from Talavera, covers the years 1809 to 1812. Our guide through the complexities of these campaigns is a man who fought under Wellington and who subsequently became the first historian of that war. Major, later General, Sir William Napier of the 43rd Light Infantry. The 43rd Regiment, in which I had the honour to serve, was brigaded with the 52nd Light Infantry and the 95th Rifles to form what became the famous Light Brigade, later the Light Division. The Army of the Peninsula was rather like a large family, with Lord Wellington as the much-respected Peter Familias. Everyone knew each other, more or less, and friendships made on the battlefield often lasted a lifetime as did mine with Harry Smith of the 95th. It is Harry Smith's remarkable story, as well as that of Wellington, that I now wish to tell. We will start, therefore, on a blazing hot morning in July 1809, with the British Army under Sir Arthur Wellesley, as he then was, having just won a touch-and-go battle at Talavera, about 70 miles southwest of Madrid. The Light Brigade, which included Harry Smith, had just arrived on the battlefield, through no fault of our own, a day too late to help our comrades in arms. What do you see, Alex? It looks like the Light Brigade arriving, General. Are you sure? I can distinctly see some green jackets. Hmm. Timely enough, I dare say. Let them take over the pickets and bury the dead. Very good, sir. Fall out now, men, but no one to leave the area. Oh, can we brew up, Mr. Smith, sir? No, Corporal Pickett. We may have to move again. Shall we smoke then, sir? Oh, yeah. If you've got any tobacco, Palmer, I'll join you. Can one obey the call of nature, sir? Oh. How can I stop you, Doubleday? Downwind, downwind, chuck a stone at him. Even off, Pickett, a bugger. <laughs> God, oh, bloody mighty. Look at them bleeding dead. Thousands of them. Just our bleeding luck if we get detail to bury them. Yeah. Corporal Prickett? Where's Mr. Smith? I was here a moment ago, mate. Message from the company commander. I company is on burying the dead. Oh, what did I tell you? Uh, I come swimming now. Corporal Prickett? Sir? We're on burying the dead. Oh, we've heard, sir. The sooner the better, then. It's getting hot. Where are we, sir? Uh, according to the map, um... Talavera.
Casualty returns are heavier than I thought, General. Well, what about the French, Fitzroy? About the same, sir, as far as we know at present. Well, the French who aren't dead have gone away, and we're still here. So I think we can say we've won, don't you? That seems a fair assumption, sir. Sir, so, write me up a victory that we can send to Whitehall. Uh, here's General Crawford, sir. Good morning, sir. I've come to report the Light Brigade, all present and... Is you're a day too late, Bomb? I can see that, sir, but we wouldn't be here at all if we hadn't marched the last 62 miles in 24 hours. Yeah, no more than I'd expect of the Light Brigade. <laughs> but it's not a bad time to arrive. Our people here are quite done in. I presume to relieve all pickets, sir, and I've given orders to start burying the dead. Good, good. And I've brought the dispatches from Whitehall, which you'll want to see. I'm inclined to doubt that. I have also brought you a letter from Lady Wellesley. You saw my wife? She gave it to me with her own fair hand. Hmm. Trust she keeps well. I believe so, sir. Thank you, Bob. We'll keep till later. Where do you plan to go from here, sir? Since you ask, let me acquaint you with a bizarre situation. Bizarre, sir? Your Spanish general, Cuenca, travels onto, or should I say, near to the battlefield in a closed carriage drawn by six, or is it eight, white mules. He never got out of his carriage for the whole of the recent action, except, I believe, to relieve himself. Now he's left the field with his so-called army. He's failed to blow the bridge at Arthur Bispo, and my flank's wide open. You ask where I'm going? I'm going back to Badahoth. Badahoth? Where else, pray? How otherwise can I protect our essential ports of Cadiz and Lisbon? You mean to tell me, sir, that I have marched my brigade in record time under the July sun all the way from Lisbon to the centre of Spain, only to go all the way back again to Badahoth? What do you consider a commander-in-chief's job to be, General Crawford? Uh, to defeat the enemy, sir. Precisely. And in order to do that, it is his first job not to lose his army. So, when my staff have had time to draw up plans, you will be getting your orders, General. Meanwhile, be so good as to look to the pickets and the dead. Good day, sir. sir. Alex, see General Crawford to his horse. Sir. Fitzroy, here, take these damn dispatches. Sir. Your master's devilish crusty this morning, Gordon. Did I hear you say you had brought a letter from Lady Wellesley, sir? So I am taking advantage of kind General Crawford. Is he a Crawford of Balcares, or one of the other family who spell their name with a U? Anyway, he kindly said he would deliver this personally to you, though I fear I have but little news. Mm -hmm. Alas... I have been suffering very much from fatigue lately, and I confess to a certain indolence about rising from bed in the morning. Little news indeed. I usually try to hear Arthur's catechism about noon when my new maid, Lucy, brings me a small posset of beef tea with a drop or two of Madeira wine in it. What? Another new maid? What happened to the old one? Dr. Fairchild considers it very strengthening for my nerves, which have been plaguing me. I think it may be due to the harassment of a number of odious tradesmen who have lately become very importunate. Ah, ah, ah now we have it. Since you left for Spain, there seem to have been so many expenses. Etc., etc., etc. Damnation, take it, bloody kitties, botch the accounts again. Fitzroy! Yes, my lord. My lord? What's this, my lord? The dispatches included a copy of the Gazette. I have to congratulate you, sir. They've given you a peerage. Have they, begone? Indeed so. And your brother, Lord Wellesley, says you are to call yourself Viscount Wellington. Does he so? Well, oh, then I'd better do as he says. Hmm. Are the horses ready? Yes, my lord. Yeah, nothing else I can do here. Uh, you will issue general orders and Crawford will take over the ground. So Alex and I might as well make a start for Badahoth. Very good, my lord. Um, uh, Fitzroy. My lord. When you were in London, were you ever acquainted with a young person by the name of, um, Harriet Wilson? No. Certainly not intimately. Good. Oh, Badahoth it is then. I remember well the house where Fitzroy Somerset and Alex Gordon were billeted in Barachoth. It belonged to a family called de Los Dolores de Leon, and it was lived in by two young ladies, chaperoned by an old housekeeper, 
whose parents had recently died. The house had a large patio in the centre with a palm tree in it where the young ladies, Victoria and Juanita, used to entertain on warm summer nights. Among their young friends were some Tunos, student musicians who wore romantic 16th century costumes and who played traditional music. Juanita was still only a schoolgirl then, but what a dancer. Better than all that hoots to stuff you do in Scotland, Alex. Uh, says the Sassaman. You dance civilianas in Scotland? Uh, well, uh, not exactly, Juanita. But we have a dance called Stripping the Willow. Stripping the what? Oh, a very savage sort of thing. The Scots have only just emerged from the Middle Ages, you know. Oh, I don't think Alexander is savage at all. <laughs> I think he's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Juanita. Are civilianas all love songs, Victoria? Oh, no. Not all, Alexander. Some are about horses or spring flowers, and many, many are in praise of Our Lady. We have a great devotion to Mary in Spain. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Sister Rosario, ask Juanita de los Dolores to come and see me, please. Yes, Reverend Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now to the hour of our death. Amen. Come in. You wanted to see me, Reverend Mother? Yes, Juanita, come in. Sit down. Yes, Reverend Mother. You have some British officers staying at your house, yes? Yes, Reverend Mother. They're very nice. One is a milor, and they both work for General Wellington. Hmm. What are their names? One is Milord Fitzroy Somerset. He is a major. And the other is a captain from Scotland called Alexander Gordon. <laughs> Good. I'm sure your sister Victoria will look after them well, just as your dear mother, God rest her, would have done. But remember one thing, child. Your visitors may be very nice, but they are probably Protestants. And Christ the Lord founded one church and one church only. And it wasn't the Church of England. Or Scotland, for that matter. Yes, Reverend Mother. Were you in chapel saying the rosary just now? No, Reverend Mother. Why not? I was playing, Reverend Mother. Hmm. Very well. But remember, it helps to say the rosary as often as possible. Our Lady always listens and never fails to answer your prayers. Yes, Reverend Mother. If properly said. Yes, Reverend Mother. Is that all? No. I sent for you because there is a priest here who wants to meet your friends, Captain Gordon and Major Somerset. I want you to take him to your house right away. His name is Father Julian. Your sister Victoria is married to Jacinto Valdiana, no? Yes, father. He's with General Ariathagar's army, but nobody knows where they are. Oh, that's a pity. How do you mean, father? That General Ariathagar should not know where he is. I don't understand. Ariathagar is not a very good General Juanita. That's all. How do you know, father? Because I know. Oh. You're not at all like Father Antonio. Oh, what is Father Antonio like? <laughs> He's pale and wrinkly, and he smells of incense and candle grease. <laughs> I hope I don't smell at all. Yes, you do. Tobacco, saddle leather, that sort of thing. You don't come from around here, do you? No, I'm from Santith, near Salamanca. 
You don't look like a priest at all. You don't even wear glasses. <laughs> Uh, or priest born blind. <laughs> You'd look more like a priest if you had glasses. I'd better get some then. You got tea, post. Oh God, right, tap. Water left, quick, march. Is he one of those partisan priests we've been hearing about? He's no more a priest than I am, my lord. He's a well-known guerrilla and a specialist in cutting out convoys and intercepting <laughs> dispatches. Cutting out liver and lights, more like. <laughs> sure the documents aren't forgeries planted by the French? I've checked. Everything fits in with the facts, such as we know them. Then it's worse than I thought. What do you say this fellow's name is? Julian Sanchez. His nom de guerre is El Charo. Hmm. He was in the Spanish army, but got out. Oh, small blame to him. Where is he now? Round at our billet, my lord. I'd like to meet this guerrillero. So, Senor Sanchez, your General Quester's out of the picture, then? He was too fat, Senor, to mm. ride a horse. And now he's had a stroke, he can't move at all. Mm. His army has just melted away. Well, I can't say I'm overwhelmed with grief. He let me down badly at Talavera. And you know, Senor Rear, uh, General Ariathaga gave himself up at Ocania on the 19th. The French took thousands of prisoners. Yes, I told him not to offer battle there. Hmm. Well, that doesn't leave Spain with much of an army. With Cuesta and Ariathaga out of the way, there's only Albuquerque left. And he is too rich to be ambitious, and too aristocratic to be political. He's brave enough, but he is only serious about horses. <laughs> That's something in his favour. You like horses, General? Uh, we all fancy a bit of bloodstock where I come from. Where's that? Ireland. Then you are a Catholic? Mm, that doesn't necessarily follow. Uh, how many men do you have under arms, Sanchez? Just over 200 at the present time. We straddle the main road to Portugal in the Sierra de Gata, just west of Salamanca. Yes, I know perfectly well where you are. Are you mounted? Well mounted, Senor. Mm, I wish I could say the same. How do you manage it? <laughs> Each time the French lose a man... We gain a horse. How oh, do you say so? Tell me, Sanchez, would you care to become incorporated into the British Army? I could offer you a commission and your men would get pay and come on our ration strength. Senoria, your men don't have enough to eat as it is. We would be taking the food out of your mouths. And I must tell you, we eat quite well. As for pay, we only have to ask... And the people of Salamanca give us all we need. Yeah, let's take a point. But you surely have no objection if I were to offer you a cash subsidy to help towards the forage, saddlery and the like? A cash subsidy? Only a fool would refuse, General. But what are your conditions? <laughs> that in the next few months you stay in the Sierra de Gata where you're ideally placed to play the devil with the French lines of communication. What are you going to do, General? Oh, keep my own counsel. <laughs> You don't trust the Spanish. I don't trust my own generals, never mind the Spanish. Spanish general would rather suffer defeat than see the English winning battles on Spanish soil. Pride and jealousy are very Spanish scenes, senoria. Mark my words. It may be you and I, senor Sanchez, who will finally have the honor of kicking the French out of Spain. Yes. What is it, Alex? There's a Lieutenant Smith of the 95th would like a word, my lord. He hasn't got an appointment. Smith? Smith, who the devil's he? What does he want? Something about greyhounds, my lord. He has a few himself and is very keen on coursing. Oh. oh. Well, send him in for a moment. Yes, my lord. Remember, Sanchez, you'll be hearing from me again. Senor. Oh, um, by the way, senor. How many white mules did General Cuesta have pulling his coat onto the battlefield? Six, was it, or eight? <laughs> Twelve, senor. Goodbye. Twelve. Lieutenant Smith, my lord. Well, Smith, does your colonel know you're here? It's hardly protocol for a subaltern to approach the commander-in-chief directly, you know. I know, sir. But Colonel Barnard said that if I could get in to see you, and if I wasn't scared of having my head bitten off if I did, well, uh, good luck. Did he indeed? Oh, you can tell, Colonel Barnard. Oh, no, 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 never mind. Sit down. Thank you, sir. What's the state of health at the moment in your regiment? Uh, not good, sir. A lot of men down with the ague. Mala era, they call it. M Mala era? 
Because the Spaniards think it's caused by the bad air rising from the river. Mala aire, as they say. Fitzroy! My lord? Let me see those sick list returns again. Yes, my lord. These are Dr. McGregor's figures up to the end of the month. Deaths from ague, 328. Sick from ague, 1,007. Oh. Sick from all other causes, only 79. Damn it, it is ridiculous. These are the sort of circumstances that people at home, particularly in Whitehall, never take into consideration. Have you had it, Smith? Uh, not so far, sir, but I go coursing most days, which takes me away from the river. Yes. Suppose you've heard I've got some new greyhounds out from England, eh? Uh, yes, sir. My friends and I, well, uh, we thought you might care for a bit of sport. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'll come, on one condition. Yes, sir? No wagers. Some of you young fellows are far too fond of gambling to be a pity to survive the campaign only to end up in Queer Street. No wages, sir. All right, then, Smith. Arrange time and place of the Gordon. Good morning. And we'll, uh, we'll see what your English dogs can do, sir. Damn saucy fellow. Hmm. You know something, Fitzroy? Hello? He's got a point about mal are, though. Why should my men be knocked down like flies just because those incompetent, stunning caddies want our presence on Spanish soil? Devil take them! And defend their own country if they can. They've ignored every bit of advice I've given them and lost two armies in consequence. I'm now going to put into practice a very simple plan I've long had up my sleeve. What's that, my lord? Have a look at this map. Portugal. Torres Vedras. Torres Vedras, yes. For the last six months, I've had the Portuguese fortifying the line of hills between the Tagus and the sea. Defended by us, and with Lisbon as our port, we will be impregnable, and we shall spend the winter there in comfort and safety. Fed and clothed by courtesy of the Royal Navy, we can cock a snook at the French. And when spring comes... And when spring comes, we shall wait for Marshal Massena to make a move. But we'll tell no one of this plan, Fitzroy. Least of all our senior officers. They're always writing to their whores in London or to the editors of newspapers giving away our secrets. Very well, my lord. And once we're behind the lines of Torres Vedras, we must find means of exercising and diverting all ranks. Look at that devil, Jackman! Tackle him, Jackman! He really wants that pig. Palmer's got it! Palmer's got it! Well done, the bomb-proof man! Any bets on bomb-proof Palmer? I'll bet on 13 platoon, Johnny. It'll go to 13 platoon, you'll see. Don't throw away your money, Harry. Oh, damn, Palmer's lost it. Oh, look who's here! Come to see the plebs at play, Cardo. I thought to take the air, see what the fancy's up to. Surprised you're not out there in the scrummage, Cardo. Catching a greasy pig, not in my line, really. The Colonel said he expected junior officers to participate. It's not that I wish to disparage you call it skills. On the contrary, it's just that I don't much care for pork meat. <laughs> Double day, double day. He's down, he's down. Ha <laughs> ha, the pig's floor, double day. <laughs> Jackman's going for him again. Look. Jackman's got him. Yes, I think Jackman's really got him this time. What did I say? The pig goes to 13 platoon. Well done, Jackman. Just look at that damn fellow. Sweet, grease, pig, covered in it. Not a very edifying spectacle. <laughs> As other ranks were diverting themselves on the field of sport, the officers were preparing to treat their Portuguese hosts to a performance of Richard Brinsley Sheridan's A School for Scandal. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, your Joseph surface is excellent, Dan. Just the right evil touch. Thanks, Freya. Johnny, don't forget to keep that rather bumbling tone in your voice, right? Bumbling, right. Otherwise, your Sir Peter is splendid. <laughs> Harry, dear boy, remember to have a good shave before tonight. Lady Teasel must be as alluring as possible. <laughs> now, um, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, in Act 4, mm -hmm. just before I go to hide behind the screen, does Dan Cardo have to get quite so close behind me? Well, he has to be seen as lecherous as possible. Yes, but he keeps treading on me damn skirt. Well, look out for that, will you, Dan? Uh, yes, of course. Sorry, Harry. Well, all if right. that's all... Tonight's the night, and good luck to us all. <laughs> oh, and uh, just one more thing. No drinking before the show. Oh. Professionals oh. never do. No. We're not professionals. All the more reason. Curtain up, eight o'clock sharp. Right. Thank you.
My God, Harry, I'd rather face Boney's cavalry any day than that audience out there. Here, Johnny, have a drop of this. What is it? Brandy? The best. Took it off that chasseur colonel we captured. But Freer said... Devil take it. I need a bit of jumping powder. Well, I suppose a drop of good stuff won't do any harm. Hmm. Oh, yeah. oh, God. Here we go. Have another swig. Thanks, old man. I'm beginning to feel more confident about my lines already. It's not my lines I'm worried about. It's my bloody skirt. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, senoras e senores, it is with great pleasure that we present the Green Jackets players in a performance of A School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. that I should persuade you to do anything you thought wrong. <laughs> no, no. I have too much honour to desire it. Don't you think we may as well leave honour out of the argument? Don't get so damn close, Cardo. Ah, the ill effects of your country education, I see, still remain with you. I mm. doubt they do indeed, and I will fairly own to you... You're treading on my bloody skirt. And I will fairly own to you... That if I could be persuaded to do wrong... That if I could be persuaded to do wrong... <laughs> it would be by Sir Peter's ill usage sooner than your honourable logic, after all. Do that again and you'll get my knee where it hurts. Then, by this knee... Hand! Uh, 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 hand, which he is unworthy of... Beg pardon, sir. It's death, you blockhead. What do you want? I thought, sir, you would not choose Sir Peter to come up without announcing him. Sir Peter? Ooms and the devil! Sir Peter? Oh, lad, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. <laughs> sir, wasn't I let him in? Oh, I'm quite undone. What will become of me now, Mr. Logic? <gasps> oh, he's on the stairs. I'll get behind this screen, and if I... <laughs> God damn it! That's my skirt gone, Carter! I'll kill you for this! It wasn't me, I swear it. You, you, you my caught it on that name! I have warned you, you get too close! Yes. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, pray a moment's silence. It seems our gallant green jackets have become involved in an engagement from which, most untypically, they have temporarily had to withdraw. <laughs> Orchestra, be so good as to play God Save the King and let the curtain come down. <laughs> While we were at play in Portugal, the French Marshal Massena and his men were starving on our doorstep. And this is where Julian Sanchez and the other guerrilleros came into their own. With Massena's lines of communication stretched out over 400 miles, the distance from the French frontier to Torres Vedras, every Spaniard with a long knife or a blunderbuss could take his personal revenge on the hated invader. That, for the time being, took care of Marshal Massena, whom the peer regarded as the most formidable of Napoleon's marshals. There remained, however, Marshal Soot, who had suppressed all Spanish resistance in Andalusia. He was now free to turn north again. What do you make of the news from Badajoz, my lord? Marshal Soult's a crafty fellow Fitzroy. He wants to tempt me out of Torres Vedras by threatening Badajoz. And shall you be tempted? Oh, tempted, yes. If he succeeds in getting inside that fortress, it'll be a costly business to get him out again. It will indeed, sir. But I shall not give in to the temptation, because if I do, Soult and Marsena, who have double our force between them, will chop us like a fox in a covert. Let General Manacho stave off Soult, and I will starve out Marsena. I feel greatly for our friends in Badajoz. I understand your concern, Alex, but the Spaniards must defend their own. Besides, I trust General Manacho. He'll not easily let the Frenchman in. Do you mind if I smoke, Reverend Mother? <laughs> I quite like the smell of cigars, General Menacho. Thank you. Now, please tell me, Reverend Mother, what 
If anything can I do for you? If Marshal Soot should attack us, General, I want to know if you intend to fight. To my last box of cigars, Madre. <laughs> to my last box of cigars. I am glad to hear you say so. Badajoz is a strong fortress. It would be something to show the rest of Spain that we can look after ourselves. Why? Why shouldn't we? We have stores aplenty. The militia are coming on well. It is only some of the regular officers I worry about. Oh, with reason. The juniors are mother's boys and sport brats. <laughs> and many of the seniors with respect, sir. It's the fault of the system. They get commissions through family connections and they are not trained in even the basics of military... <coughs> military procedure. But our countrymen are brave people. <clears throat> they are used to hardship. Why shouldn't they make good soldiers? <laughs> they might, under British officers. Whom they would not understand. The British understand discipline. If you soldiers want to know the meaning of discipline, ask a novice nun. <laughs> Haven't I often said... <laughs> Haven't I often said that what my raw recruits need is not a month on the barrack square under a sergeant major, but a month in the cloister under Madre Stolidath? <laughs> I would have no difficulty with your soldiers, General. Women are far more difficult to manage. And who are you informing of this fact, Madre? I, who have seven unmarried daughters... <laughs> Let me tell you, if I castigate one of my sometimes rude and often rebellious daughters for being rude and or rebellious, my wife comes rushing to their defense. Then my wife and I come into conflict, the daughters rejoice, and I withdraw from the field. Perhaps some of them will end up in my convent. <laughs> Let us drink to that greatly to the desired possibility, Madre. Oh, no thank you, Dennis. One glass of your excellent manzanilla is quite enough for me. Mm. Besides, I have work to do. And if there is a siege, what will you do with your nuns? First, I will close the school. The children must take their chances along with their families. Mm. Some of the younger nuns must be left to take care of the orphans. The rest of us, we will put ourselves under your orders, General, to mm. cook to help in the hospital, whatever is required. Ah, uh, Madre, what a pity you took the veil. I'd give you a company to command any day if I could. <laughs> There's one little thing you could do for me, General. Mm. You know that they lost Dolores' family. Uh, both parents are dead, yes? Yes. Mm. And their farm has been destroyed by the French, all their olive trees cut down for firewood. They need money. The youngest, Juanita, is very bright and speaks excellent French. Can you find her a job in your office? Send her to me tomorrow. Thank you, General. Mm -hmm. Another thing, if the French do besiege the town, do you think we can expect help from the English? Mm -hmm. General Wellington intends to win the war. He will only do whatever will help him to that end. And then we must look to our own devices. Mm -hmm. But if the French do capture the town... They will do so over my dead body, Madre. I promise you that. <laughs> my nuns and I. We shall pray for you, General. Thank you, Madre. <laughs> There's a great power in the prayers of nuns. <laughs> <laughs> happen if the French take Badajoz, Vicky? They won't. How do you know? Well, this is one of the strongest fortresses in the whole of Spain, and General Menacho will never let them in. But if they did get in? They won't. But if they did? There's no point in thinking about it, Juanita. You know what the women are all saying in the market? I don't want to know what those stupid women are saying in the market. They're saying that if the French take the town, all the women will be... You know. Oh, stop it. Stop it, stop it. Oh, I am sorry, Vicky. I am sorry there. Don't cry. Please don't cry. I'm sorry for being so silly. My nerves are bad. I haven't felt well ever since Jacinto went away. Do you miss him? Yes. I do miss him. Jacinto wasn't very kind to you always, was he? How do you know, Juanita? Because I know. 
But if you miss him, you miss him. <laughs> You're too young to understand. <sighs> you think so? I understand everything. You forget. I spent much more time on our farm at Oliventa than you did. Miguelin and I used to watch the cows and the bulls. <laughs> How can you be so shameless, Juanita? <laughs> anyway, that's not at all what I mean. Oh, yes, it is. No. Let me try and tell you. I mean, all those times when I half wake in the night and... and I put out my hand to where he always is and... and there's nobody there. It's the familiarity, the comfort of having him there that I miss. Oh, who on earth can that be? Look out of the window, Juanita. It's a priest. I, I, I can't see very well, but... It could be that young priest, or what's his name? Father Julian, who was here before, when the English were here. What does he want, I wonder? Perhaps he's taken a fancy to you, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> what am I saying? A priest? The shamelessness of you. <laughs> Go and let him in. Oh, goodness, what a mess. My hair. <laughs> Hello, Annie. How are you, Freddy? Very well, thank you, Father. Is your sister Victoria? Yes, she is. Please come. Thank you. Vicky, here's Father Julian to see you. Oh, good day, Father. Come in. Won't you sit down? Thank you, but I won't stay long. You're married to Jacinto Rariano, no? Yes, he's my husband. You know him. He comes from St. Heath. Yes, that's right. So do I. We were at school together. Oh. When I was last here in Badajoz to see Lord Wellington, Juanita asked me if I could find out about him. Yes, you have news. Yes, I have some news, but I'm afraid only of a negative nature. Oh, please, tell me, Father. Your husband's name is not on the list of those killed or wounded at the Battle of Orcania. Oh, thanks be to God. But his name is not on the list of those taken prisoner of war, either. Oh. Well, then you mean he is missing? Yes. Jacinto Rariano would appear to be missing. Juanita. Why not, Miguelim? It's been nearly three years since I was at our farm. It's not just the three years. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, you say your father and mother are all right? Oh, yes, they're all right. Oh, thanks be to God. Tell me what happened. Well, when the French first came to the farm, they slept in the outbuildings and started cutting trees for firewood. My father went to the sergeant and said they could have last year's prunings free, but not to cut the olive trees. And did they? They soon used up the prunings and started to cut the trees again. What did your father do? He went to the sergeant again. But the sergeant told my father he was lucky the French had come to free the peasants like him from the landlords in the name of liberty, equality and fraternity. Oh, your father would not have liked that. Oh, no, 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 no. He said that if... Uh, Robbing people's olive groves was liberty, equality, and fraternity. Then the sergeant could... <laughs> he then said something very rude about Bonaparte. <laughs> and then the Frenchman hit my father across the face. Juanita! Juanita! Oh, no. Here comes the apothecary's wife. Oh, Juanita, my child. What times, what terrible times. I hear the French have cut down all your olive trees and murdered everyone on your farm. How will you live now, you poor orphan thing? It's not quite as bad as well, No trees, no olives, no oil, no money, no parents. Dear God, how will you live? But I didn't murder him. How will you ever find a husband? How will you ever find a husband now? Dear God above, what times, what times, what terrible times. What a cat. Townspeople. So, what are you going to do now, Miguelin? I'm going to become a militiaman. You? Yeah, why not? I'm going to be attested tomorrow. I was on my way to the quartermaster stores to draw a musket and bayonet. I'll soon be on active service. I got you. Active service. It won't be long now, I can tell you. They say some French cavalry are already waste of the river. Oh, Juanita. Oh, there you are. Sister Rosario. Oh. What's the matter? I've been looking for you everywhere. Madre Soledad says she wants to see you. Me? What for? I don't know, but she said it was urgent. Very well. Goodbye, Miguelin. 
Come to the house when you get some time off. No, I don't think you get much time off on active service, Juanita. Well, good luck anyway. Uh, thanks. Goodbye. I don't understand it, Sister Rosario. School is a closing. I have a good, well, quite good report. Why on earth should Madrid Solidad want to see me? I wanted to speak to you about your French, Juanita. My French, Reverend Mother? I have been talking to General Manacho. About my French? Oh, of course not. General Manacho asked me to recommend a reliable girl to help with secretarial work at his headquarters. I recommended you. Oh, thank you, Reverend Mother. Now, listen to me carefully, child. General Manacho is a brave and honorable soldier who is determined to defend this town to his utmost ability. Huh? But nobody can foresee the fortunes of war. And a man can only do as much as the materials at his disposal enable him to do. I am not sure that I quite follow what you... Let me go on. And I am speaking to you in confidence, Juanita, because I trust you and because your mother was a friend of mine. I don't want my words repeated to anyone. I promise, Reverend Mother. You've turned out to be a pretty girl, Juanita. And I must warn you to behave with extreme discretion at all times. But, but what has this to do with my French? I'm coming to that. In the event of the French occupying this town, and I pray to God that it may never happen, you, Juanita, will be in a special position. Oh? Unlike most of your fellow citizens, you speak French. This has advantages and disadvantages. In the first place, French soldiers will want to talk to you. And they may say improper things. No worse than the Spanish soldiers, I am sure. <laughs> Please don't interrupt. French laxity in morals is notorious and has got worse since the revolution. Some of the soldiers, particularly their officers, in their desire for communication with the opposite sex, may say indiscreet things. Do you follow me? What sort of things, Reverend Mother? I don't mean what you're thinking, Juanita. Sorry, Reverend Mother. I mean things relating to their army's dispositions, their future movements, pay, lines of communication. If by chance you should hear anything of this sort, I want to know at once. I want any and every scrap of information that might be of use to our army or to our allies, the English, in the fight to rid our country of its godless invader. Now, do you understand, child, what I meant when I said I wanted to talk to you about your friend? Yes, sir. What's that, Reverend Mother? There can be only one thing. The French. The worst fears of the inhabitants of Badajoz were realized when, in January 1811, Marshal Soot marched north and besieged the town. No help could come from the British, who were still in Portugal holding off Marshal Massena from behind the lines of Torres Vedras. Do you think the French will get into Badajoz, Fitzroy? The pier doesn't seem to think so. All the same. It's awful to think that our friends there are being menaced by General Soult while we're unable to do a damn thing about it. I appreciate your concern, Alex. Though I suspect it is primarily for a young lady called Doña Victoria de los Dolores de Aureliana. <laughs> Don't remind me of Aureliana, Fitzroy. I've already entertained some unworthy thoughts about the possibility of his being killed in action. Perhaps he has been. Stop it. Extra matrimonial entanglements, Alex. They can bring down the best of them. I know. Look at Uxbridge. The best cavalry commander we've got. But he has to go and elope and now look at him. His career's in ruins. So much the worse for all of us. And there's the peer's own brother, Wellesley. Half his children don't know who their father is. He seems to have got away with it, though. I don't quite know how. <laughs> and the peer himself is always going on rather coyly about that whore, Harriet Wilson. Mm. Eh, it's rather touching, really. He's not at all a fornicator at heart. I only hope she doesn't squeeze him for money. <laughs> what do demi-reps do that isn't for money? Quite. Poor fellow, he's not at all well off, and Kid is always getting into debt. Pity about that marriage. Well, yes, in one way. But looking at it another, yes. he's really happy campaigning. Many senior officers out here spend their time fretting about their families or their estates and are longing to get home. 
others with attractive youngish wives are in a constant state of anxiety lest they're having the horns put on them. But not the peer. Mm. He's got his friends and his pack of foxhounds, and he's happy here. Hmm? Hold hard there, sir. What's all the hurry? I'm looking for army headquarters, sir. Can you tell me where it is? I can indeed. We're going there ourselves, if you care to come along. Oh, thank you very much, but I'm in a bit of a hurry. So it seems. Where are you from? From Marshal Beresford on the frontier. I've got an urgent dispatch for the Commander-in-Chief. Have you, sir? My name's Somerset, and I'm military secretary to the Commander-in-Chief. Oh, then you're just the man I want, sir. Where's the dispatch? In my haversack, sir. Wait be a second. Stand still. Do you know what's in it? No idea, sir. Only that it's urgent. The Marshal had some news yesterday from Salamanca, brought in by a gorilla. El Charo? I don't know, sir. But here you are. My God. Hmm? Come on, Alex, at the gallop. Right. Follow on, whatever your name is. Ah, there you are, Fitzroy. Come in. Sir, I'm afraid I've got I've just written to Mr. Hobie. Do you get your boots from Hobie, Fitzroy? Uh, no, sir. Uh, there, there's I some know right... a lot of people prefer law, but Hobie does me well enough. Yes, sir, I'm sure, sir. I'm but... sick of struggling into hessians. I've ordered a very simple boot. Straight at the top and loose round the ankle so that you can get in and out of My it. lord, I have to tell you that Badahoff has fallen. Hell and damnation. How? Why? General Minacho was killed by a stray ball. Someone called Imaz took over who didn't apparently put up much of a fight. Damnation, take it. I was counting on Manacho. With Marshal Soult sitting pretty on the frontier, Marsena can now hang on here for as long as he likes. Damnation! What's up out there? Alex will attend to it, sir. It's O'Malley of the Light Dragoons, my lord. He said Massena's gone. Gone? Gone? Seems like it. Oh! Send O'Malley in, Alex. And get me Generals Crawford and Stapleton Cotton here immediately. Yes, sir. So, Marsena can't have heard yet about Badahoth. What luck! When we cross the frontier this time, please, God, we shall never come back. Lieutenant O'Malley, my lord. So, the old devil's gone, eh? Cleared out bag and baggage, sir. They must have gone early in the night and built their fires up to fool our pickets. How far did you patrol? A good 15 miles along the Santa Rame Road, sir. But there's neither hide nor hair of it. Uh, thank you for bringing me some good news, O'Malley. Sir. Tell me, are you by any chance one of the Galway O'Malley's? I am indeed, sir. Ever get a day's hunting at Tua Molochre? Any time you're out that way, my lord, we'd be happy to give you a day with the Blazers. Well, if Marsena's broken cover, we've another fox to hunt now. Wellington had literally starved out the French, and Marshal Massena was now obliged to take the long road back to their strongholds of Alameda and Ciudad Rodrigo in northwestern Spain. Spring was now come, and the British soldiers were happy to be on the move again, though perhaps they had become a little slow and soft during the winter months in Portugal. Oh, look! There's a golden oriole. It's very hard to catch sight of the devils. They're very shy birds. This is the River Coa, all right. Weird, those huge granite boulders. Look, there's a blue rock thrush. You hey, don't see one of those every day of the week. Never mind the blue what you call them. It's that dirty-looking spalpeen over there I've got my eye on. Where? By the bridge there. He's no ordinary bog trotter, I'm telling you. What do you think he's up to? No good, I'll be bound. Ambush? Could be. Hold the patrol, Sergeant. Keep a sharp lookout. Patrol! Halt! Hello! Englishman! Who are you? The plane! Come on! Go to the plane then! Cheeky bastard. We're from Wellington's army! Who the hell are you? <laughs> We've been waiting for you in the bed. Why you been so long? Where are the French? Gone. A long time. Maybe 12, 15 hours. You are very slow. I'm going to punch this damn fellow on the nose in a minute. Look here. Just tell us who you are. I am the special man of the Julian's 
El Charo? Isn't that the gorilla chap? Yes, I think so. My chief, he's a good friend of your hand with a dog. He wants you to come. All right then, I'll come. I don't know about that, Harry. My orders are to keep going till we see the Frenchers. Then we'd better split up. You go on with the patrol, I'll go and visit El Charo. Do you think that's wise now? I don't know if it's wise, but he should be able to tell us a good deal about the state of the French. Besides, I want to see how they live, these guerrilleros. I'm glad you have come, Captain. What is your name? Harry Smith. Harry Smith. I'm glad you have come, because it is necessary for me to talk with someone from General Wellington before you catch up with my sailor. But I'm only on patrol. I'm not on Lord Wellington's staff. No? But you can tell them. Yes. I know one of his aides-de-camp. Who? Alex Gould. Good, I know him too. You must tell him that my Sena has been supplied with food and ammunition from Ciudad Rodrigo. So now he will stand and fight. Perhaps near here on the border. I think it will be at Fuente Signoro. I'll tell them. Marshal Massena must be feeling a happy man now that Sult has taken Badajoz. Taken Badajoz? Sult didn't take it, he bought it. You look surprised, my friend. Well, I'm, I'm not used to opposing generals buying and selling fortresses. Oh, you mean you have no traitors in your country? Well, how should I know? Our country's not been overrun by the French. Well, at least not since 1066. Right, my friend. And nobody can tell how people will behave until they have experienced it. If Badajoz is the key to this campaign, as it seems to be... It's going to cost a lot of British lives getting the French out of it. British lives? And how many Spanish lives are lost with every British victory? You British are always telling us we have no discipline. But when your people are storm my town, they are worse, much worse than the French. It is their own allies they loot and rape and murder. Now steady on. I know bad things have happened. But we're only fighting your bloody war for you because you can't do it for yourselves. And because your politicians want to get rid of Napoleon. I know, I know, I know. Listen, we don't have our own king because Bonaparte tricked him out of his throne. We don't have any leadership because we don't have a government. Just a set of politicians playing their own dirty games. So we have to depend on you English who rape our women and plunder our towns. What can you do? Our fellows fight like the very devil to capture their objectives. If they achieve them, those that are still alive, they go straight for the drink. In no time at all, they don't give a damn who or what they're fighting for. What are you fighting for, Captain? What are you doing in Spain? That's easy enough. I took the king's shilling. I hold the king's commission. I'm bound to fight whoever or wherever it is required. I too was once a regular soldier. But that is not why I'm fighting now. So why do you fight? See this earth. It's mine. And no French bastard of the great whore is going to take it from me. That's why. Juanita? Juanita? I've signed the letters. Yes, Captain. Coming, Captain. Yes, Captain. Coming, Captain. My name is Jean-Pierre Sula. I have told you, you may call me Jean-Pierre. Have I not? Yes, Captain. Yes, Captain. We work in the same office. Why all this formality? It is necessary to be formal because you are the enemy. <laughs> what do you mean I'm the enemy? Do I, do I look like an enemy? Do I have Spanish babies impaled on the end of my sword? You are the enemy of the Spanish people, Capitan. <laughs> Idiotic. I am in the town hall of Badajoz helping to administer the town, and you are in the town hall of Badajoz helping me to help administer the town. Somebody has to do it. Well, it does matter whether it is the French or the Spanish. Or the English. Oh, yes. The English. They were here, you know. They were. And will be again. How can you say that? Nobody can predict the fortunes of war. Before the English can get back into the Badajoz, they will have to defeat Marshal Massena, they will have to take the fortress of Alameda, 
and they will have to capture Ciudad Rodrigo. There is a convoy now on its way to reinforce Ciudad Rodrigo with men, food and supplies of every sort. Oh, really? Yes, indeed. Uh, I must go and have my lunch. My landlady is very strict. Ah, the apothecary's wife. Hmm. She's also very mean. I hope she feeds you properly. Oh, one must not complain in time of war, but you know we French are not accustomed to so many dried beans. <laughs> at home we have... Uh, where is your home, Cavidan? In the Gironde. I live at Barsac, near Bordeaux. Oh. You are married? Certainly. We have a little oh. boy, aged four. How nice. Now you better go for your lunch, or the apothecary's wife will be gross. I know what she's like. I'll see you later, my little cabbage. Now to tell Madre, sorry then. Run, run, run. I must run all the way. No, 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 I mustn't. No, I must not run, or it will look obvious. The apothecary's wife is always looking out of her window. We luck she will be cooking her disgusting puchero for poor Captain Sula. I don't want her to see me and say in front of him, why is it silly girl Juanita in such a hurry? Oh, dear. I must look calm and casual and smile and not look serious. Oh, dear. What a strain. And particularly now I'm in a state of sin. First, I was in love with a priest, Padre Julian. That must be a sin. Now I am in love with the enemy of my country, Captain Sula, a married man. And that's a double sin. But I'm going to betray him. So does that cancel out this sin? Or does it mean that I'm not really in love with him? Oh, dear. I must go to confession. But there's never any time. Be tranquil, child. Sit down and get your breath. Yes, Reverend Mother. There's seldom anything so urgent that one has to run. Not that it matters at your age. Now... What's the news? There's a French convoy on its way with reinforcements for Theodore Rodrigo. Who told you? Captain Sola. Good. What is the nature of the convoy? An important one, I think. Main, food and general supplies. Which must mean ammunition and possibly pay for the troops. Very good, Juanita. Anything else? Yes, Reverend Mother. There is something. Well... What is it? Speak up, child. Well, I think I am in a state of sin. What sort of sin? I think... I think I have fallen into temptation. What sort of temptation? Uh, carnal temptation. Oh, is that all? Everybody suffers from that from time to time. It's all rubbish. If you've got anything serious to confess, see Father Antonio, wherever it is you go to. Priests are expert at that sort of thing. Oh, thank you, Reverend Mother. Uh, what is it, child? Oh, Father Antonio. Yes? Well, I don't think he's really an expert. I mean, he doesn't look as if he's ever had a carnal thought in his life. General Packenham, my lord. Ah, come in, Ned. Sit thank down. You. Tell me... Have you had any problems with the commissariat, getting rations up and so on? <laughs> My men have been marching 20 miles a day on near-starvation rations. And when the food does come up, it's not fit to eat. Mm. Then, when the poor devils do a bit of scrounging on the side, you threaten to hang them for looting. <laughs> To answer your question, if I could get my hands on that commissary, I think I'd shoot him. Well, you'll have to take your turn. How's that? The commissary was in here five minutes ago, complaining bitterly that Bob Crawford had threatened to shoot him. Well, if Bob says he's going to, he probably will. Yeah, that's what I'm frightened of. Yeah. I've written to my brother Wellesley to sort the whole lot out. He's quite well in at Whitehall, and he's a damn sight more diplomatic than I am. Uh, how about a glass of Madeira, Ned? It's oh. quite well, considering the shaking up it's had. Oh, good. Thank you. You know, talking of Whitehall, 
Reminds me of St. James's Park. The favourite place for taking the air of a young person by the name of Harriet Wilson. <laughs> oh, you know her, Ned? <laughs> Most certainly I do. Uh, thank you. As does about every beau, buck and dandy serving in the peninsula. Not excepting my esteemed brother-in-law. <laughs> what? You, you know about me? As does everybody between the Thames and the Tagus. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, not everybody. I mean, not my sister Kitty, for example. Uh, it doesn't shock you, then, that I've been unfaithful to Kitty? Not in the least. The only thing that mildly shocked me at the time was when you came back from India and proposed marriage to her. Uh, no one was expecting it. How's that, then? Well, you had been five years abroad. You were under no obligation, as we in the family saw it. I felt I was under an obligation. <laughs> but when you got back... Kitty was almost engaged to Larry Cole. You could have left it like that, and probably Kitty would be Lady Cole rather than Lady Wellington today. I couldn't do that, Ned. Before I went to India, we had an understanding. By honour, I was obliged to repeat my offer of marriage when I came back. The surprise was that she accepted me. Hmm. For your sake, Arthur, more's the pity that she did. You and Kitty were never suited. Mm. As even our honeymoon wasn't a success... As I remember it, we spent most of the time playing music, scraping at our fiddles together. Hmm. Kitty has no great talent for the fiddle. We must have sounded like two seagulls unsuccessfully trying to mate. <laughs> but it was the nearest we ever came to passion. One cannot be but sorry for both of you. Well, it's nice of you to put it like that, Ned. As Kitty's brother, it would have been reasonable for you to have taken a less kindly view. I'm just relieved that you and Larry never came to calling each other out. Oh, <laughs> that would have been a novel way of deciding who you would have for a brother-in-law. <laughs> hey, Ned. <laughs> Come in. Good news, my lord. Tell me. El Charo has attacked an important convoy on its way to Ciudad Rodrigo and captured a lot of booty. Is your source of information reliable, Alex? A subaltern of the rifles, Smith, is oh. here now. Oh, that saucy fellow who's always trying to lay hands on my greyhounds. <laughs> That's the one, sir. He was with El Charo at the time. Oh, was he, be God. Send him in. Yes, sir. You know, Ned, there are some people in this army who simply regard this campaign as a government-sponsored sporting tour. I'm not surprised. The commander-in-chief sets them a pretty good example. <laughs> 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 Lieutenant Smith, my lord. Sir. Sit down, Smith. This is General Packenham. I know the general by sight, sir. Now, first of all, Smith, what the devil were you doing with Sanchez, or El Charo, as he likes to be called? I was on patrol with the light dragoons, my lord. My colonel gave me leave to because I speak Spanish. Your colonel seems to give you quite a lot of license one way and another. What happened? Well, sir, we came across El Charo's men on the banks of the Coa. Don Julian expressed a wish to speak to a British officer, so I went. He was a bit prickly at first, but we got on all right in the end. Yeah, tell me about the convoy. Yes, sir. Well, in the early hours of Wednesday morning, Julian, uh, that is El Charo, got an urgent message emanating from Badajoz, I think, that there was a large convoy approaching Ciudad Rodrigo under escort of a squadron of cavalry and a battalion of infantry. Julian decided to attack it. And what business had you to take part? Well, sir, under the circumstances, I could hardly say goodbye, I think I'll go home now, could I? So I went along. Squadron of cavalry and an infantry battalion. Quite a tall order. I warned Sanchez against pitched battles. Oh, well, proceed. By first light, we were in position near a quarry to the east of the town. Soon after, we saw the convoy approaching, cavalry in front, then a number of stores wagons, including one which appeared to be very heavy because it was drawn by six mules, mm. and finally the infantry taking up the rear. Julian sent out a detachment of charros. They can really ride those fellows. Yes, yes, go on. They were to go and pull faces at the Frenchmen. The French cavalry immediately gave chase, and the Charos, pretending to be running away, led them beautifully into the quarry where we blocked them in. I don't suppose any of them got out alive. Yes. Meanwhile? Meanwhile, sir, the commander of the convoy must have lost his head, because he ordered the stores wagons to make a run for it towards the town, while the infantry formed square to receive cavalry. Mm -hmm. What then? Well, we just ignored the infantry, and stood there looking silly, whilst we galloped off after the transports, well out of musket range. Julian had a new cannon which he was very anxious to try out. Oh, so he's going for artillery now, is he? Yes, sir. Again, luck was on our side, because the third shot caught the big wagon full amidships and blew it up. It was the pay chest, full of gold coin. There was gold all over the place. A lot of coins got blown into the bodies of the drivers. In fact, the commanding officer of the convoy himself was riddled with doubloons. I'm afraid the charros were not too nice about picking the coins out with their knives. 
Uh, he was dead by this time, of course. Well, I'm glad about that. What happened to the infantry? <laughs> when they saw we'd captured all the stores, they just formed up and withdrew. I tried to organise a charge, but, well, with all that gold about the place... Yes, mm. quite. There are certain factors in war that Whitehall never takes into account. Ladies, loot... And corrupt commissaries, I might add. Yes, there may be one less by now. Very well, Smith. Go back to Colonel Barnard and tell him I'll second you to the guerrillas any time he wants to get rid of you. Very good, my lord. Thank you. Mm. Worth keeping an eye on that young fellow, Ned. He's got initiative and intelligence. Oh, I've heard he's quite a gallant officer. I'm sick of gallant officers. The army's full of them. What I need is a few more officers with a touch of cowardice and a lot more brain. Hundred and ninety six, a hundred and ninety seven, a hundred and ninety eight. Why have so many of these coins got a black sticky substance on them, I wonder? A hundred and ninety nine, two hundred. Two hundred gold doubloons for the convent. How very kind of Don Julia. What a lovely windfall, Reverend Mother. What are you going to do with it? Oh, it is so much that one's doing, Sister Rosario. The lavatories are a disgrace. But the junior school needs new desks. Oh, they do. Never mind about the lavatories, Reverend Mother. We're Spanish. Lord Wellington finally caught up with Massena and defeated him at Fuentes de Onoro, just as El Charo had predicted. Poor Massena, perhaps the best of Napoleon's generals, was ignominiously recalled and his place taken by the much younger Marshal Marmont. By January 1812, the peer had taken Ciudad Rodrigo, where, sadly, Bob Crawford was killed leading the assault. But this success now opened the way to Badajoz. Please see who that is, sister. Yes, Reverend Mother. Juanita, of love. It's Juanita de los Dolores, Reverend Mother. Come in, Juanita. I've got some good news for you. And I have got some for you, Reverend Mother. Theodad Rodrigo has fallen to the English. Oh, so you've heard already? You mean to say you know? I have just been informed of the fact. Oh. Sister Rosaria, would you please go to the refectory? And if the messenger has finished his meal, bring him here. Very well, Reverend Mother. Now, Juanita, how did you hear, Captain Sula? Yes, Reverend Mother. The French seem very worried about the British advance. They are reinforcing everything and putting mines and horrible spikes and sharpened sword blades in all the likely places of attack. So, no, I have a surprise for you, Juanita. Huh? Come in. Miguel! Oh, hello, Juanita. <laughs> oh, I thought you were a prisoner of the French. I was, but not anymore. Oh, I have so much to tell you. Take your friend to the visitor's room, Juanita. You can have ten minutes only because this young man must get back through the French lines before curfew. Now, off you go. Oh, thank you, Reverend Mar. Come, Miguelin. When we realized that the column was getting near Salamanca, we thought they'd probably put us in a prisoner of war camp there. Oh. So, it was now or never. A few of us made a break for it that night, all running in different directions. Mm. You know, one poor bastard. Oh, sorry, Juanita. <laughs> one poor mm. fellow got shot. But three of us got away to the woods and walked all night. You know, we had no idea where we were at the time. But I, I now know that we were in the mountains near Sequeros. Now, there's plenty of water, but we had no food at all for two days and nights. Oh, poor things. Anyway. On the third morning, we ran into a patrol of charros who gave us food and took us back to their camp. Ah. When Don Julian found out who we were and where we came from, he signed the Tia Vasson. <laughs> I'm now one of his special messengers because I'm very good at getting through the French lines in and out of Barajoz. It's wonderful that you are alive, Miguelin, and thank God for it. Oh, it's so good to see you again, Juanita. Do you think the English will come? Do I think? Their advance guard is already across the Tagus and Alcantara. Time is up, Miguelin. You have only 15 minutes before curfew. Goodbye, Juanita. Oh, you are looking very pretty. 
Goodbye, Madre. Thank you for the meal. Thank you for your information, Miguelin. Go carefully. I will. Oh, Reverend Marr, Miguelin says the British are at Alcantara. They are obviously going to try and recapture by the horse, then. Is that bad? If the French are going to defend the town and you say that they are preparing to do so, of course it is. Why? It stands to reason. The harder the battle, the worse it must be for us. But if the English should win, and we must hope they do... You think they might sack the town? If it is God's will that they sack the town, they will sack it. They usually do. In which case, we must offer it up to God as a penance for our sins. Reverend Mother, I am frightened. Console yourself with the thought that General Wellington and his staff were well looked after when they were last in Barajoth. That's true. Oh, but Reverend Mother... Kiss me, child, and pray to Our Lady to make you as brave as she was. After a 20-day battering from our guns, on Easter Sunday, 1812, the breaches in the walls of Badahoth were declared practicable. A scene was now set for one of the most savage battles of modern times. From every unit taking part, its forlorn hope, a storming party of volunteers to do or die, stood by to force an entry into this vital border fortress. But the French, under a resolute commander, were as equally determined to keep us out. The breaches in the walls of Badajoz have been declared ready and the assault will take place tonight. I'm calling for volunteers for the forlorn hope. The forlorn hope that's going in at the Trinidad breach. Major O'Hare and Captain Kincaid are leading it and Sergeant Prickett is with them and I need seven more men. Volunteers for the forlorn hope. Come on, 13th Batu, let's have you. What do you want to go and volunteer for, Pongo? I just thought I would, that's all. You must be balmy. It's so bleeding cold here, I kind of fancied something a bit hot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll be in for a hot place soon enough, volunteering for the forlorn hope. <laughs> You'll be roasting for all eternity. Oh, very poetic. But I'll be in good company, won't I? What do you mean? Well, I volunteered for you as well, didn't I? You what? You volunteer for me? Nobody can't volunteer for nobody else. It's a private matter. It cannot be done. Smithy's got your name on his list, hasn't he, though? I've not volunteered never in me bleeding life. Not for nothing, I haven't. Oh, God. Captain Harry Smith, 95th Rifles. The breach and the ramparts were full of the enemy looking quietly at us, although not firing a shot. As soon as our ladders were ready and the column in the very act to move, our commanding officer, Colonel Barnard, called out, Now, The very first shot from us brought down such a hail of fire as I shall never forget. the ladders and rushed at the breach. But we were broken and carried no weight with us, though every soldier was a hero. I am Corporal Edward Costello of the 95th Rifles. For the second time, I volunteered for the forlorn hope. After having received a double ration of grog, we fell in about eight o'clock in the evening. I happened to be on the right of the front section when my old officer, Major O'Hare, came up with Captain Johnny Kincaid, both in command of the storming party. A pair of uglier men never walked together, but a brace of better soldiers never stood before the muzzle of a Frenchman's gun.
now a multitude bounded up the great breach as if driven by a whirlwind. But across the top glittered a range of sword blades, sharp pointed, keen edged on both sides and firmly fixed in ponderous beams chained together and set deep in the ruins. A rifleman stood among the sword blades on the top of one of the chevaux de fris. We made a glorious rush to follow, but alas, in vain. He was knocked over. All were awfully wounded except, I believe, myself and little Freer of B Company. I am Quartermaster William Surtees, 95th Rifles, and was stationed on a little knoll just back from the Trinidad Gate. All sorts of arms were playing at once, guns, mortars, musketry, grenades and barrels of gunpowder thrown down from the walls, while every few minutes explosions from mines were taking place. Lord Wellington had also taken his stance upon this hill and appeared quite uneasy at the troops seeming to make no progress. I saw my poor friend, Major Peter O'Hare, who saved my life at Fuentes de Onoro, lying dead upon the breach. Two or three musket balls had passed through his breast. I remembered his last words just before he marched off to lead the advance. He shook my hand, saying, A Lieutenant Colonel, or cold meat in a few hours, Harry. Officers of all ranks, followed more or less numerously by the men, were seen to start out as if struck by sudden madness and rush into the breach. Two hours passed until these vain efforts had convinced the troops that the breach of Trinidad was impregnable. His lordship now seemed to lose all patience, and aide de camp was sent to ascertain the cause of the delay. They flew like lightning, while the whole rampart round the town seemed enveloped in one flame of fire. At length, a dispatch arrived from General Picton, stating that he had established himself in the castle. This was cheering news to his lordship, who expressed very strongly the gratitude he felt for that gallant officer. Corporal Costello, I heard a cheering, which I know to proceed from within the town, and shortly afterwards a cry of, Blood and hounds, where's the light division? I had been knocked off the ladder in the first rush, and there were dead and dying on top of me. I now attempted to rise, but found myself unable to stand. At this moment, I saw two or three riflemen moving towards me. One named Bombproof Palmer immediately exclaimed, What? Is that you, Ned? We thought you laddermen all done for. Yet who shall do justice to the bravery of the British soldiers? Who shall measure out the glory of men like O'Hare of the 95th, who perished on the breach at the head of the Stormers, and with him nearly all the volunteers for that desperate service? Who shall describe the martial fury of that desperate rifleman, who, in his resolution to win, thrust himself beneath the chained sword blades and there suffered the enemy to dash his head to pieces with the end of their muskets. comes a scene of horror I would willingly bury in oblivion. The atrocities committed by our soldiers on the poor, innocent and defenceless inhabitants of the city, no words suffice to depict. Supported by Palmer, we proceeded in the direction of the marketplace. We entered a house that was occupied by a number of men of the 3rd Division. One of them, on perceiving me wounded, struck the neck off a bottle of wine and presented it to me, which relieved me for the time. Unhappily, they discovered the two daughters of the old patron who had concealed themselves upstairs. They were both young and very pretty. The mother, too, was shortly afterwards dragged from her hiding place. I will not dwell on the frightful scene that followed. Some other men broke into a local convent, and God forgive them, had their will on the nuns there. Quartermaster Surtees. I went into a genteel house. The Spaniard told me the French Quartermaster General had lived with him. 
I told him I too was a quartermaster. Then he kindly set a bottle of wine and two glasses on the table. I sat down and drank nearly the whole bottle of wine while he fried me some eggs and bacon. Too truly did our heretofore noble soldiers disgrace themselves. Though the officers exerted themselves to the utmost to repress it, many who had escaped the enemy being wounded by their own men. Yet this scene of debauchery, however cruel to many, to me has been the cause of solace and the whole happiness of my life. Look at those drunken sots! I'd kick their asses if I didn't know they'd turn around and bane at me. Last night's heroes, eh? Oh, look at that brute in women's clothes with a ham impaled on his bayonet. Oh, wait till I catch them with their hangovers. What can any decent Spaniard think of our people now? I hope the C&C hangs a few of the bastards. God, I feel as if I've been to Donnybrook Fair. Well, nothing broken. No, I don't think so. You've got two bullet holes in your cap, did you know? Have I? <laughs> so I have! <sighs> my pockets are full of dirt. Look at my trousers. Covered in other people's blood. How did you manage to get away with it, Freya? Well, at five foot two, I suppose one doesn't present a very big target. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. There's nothing else we can do here. Yeah. We might as well get back to camp. I could do with a cup of tea. If my man West hasn't got a brew on, he'll be returned to duty at the double. Cup of tea, sir. That's very welcome, West. Here you are, Mr. Freer. Oh. You enjoy it while it's hot. Thanks, West. Oh, here comes Captain Kinkata. My God, Johnny! I thought you were a goner. Where'd you get that fine <laughs> horse from? One of the French. I saved it from being skewered by a drunken Commodore Ranger. <laughs> he gave it to me as a token of gratitude and esteem. Who was he? An officer? Yes, on the staff. Said he came from Bordeaux. Barsac or somewhere. You could call the horse Monsieur Barsac. <laughs> Tea, sir. Uh, no, thanks, West. I think I've had too much brandy. <laughs> Some drunken bastards from 3rd Division were trying to force old Nosey to drink with them. Oh. <laughs> they were calling him Old Fellow, if you please. Uh-oh, how did he like that? Touched his hat with his forefinger, said morning, and rode on, as if he were going to breakfast at Poodles. <laughs> <laughs> cool devil. <laughs> hey, who are those two women coming over? They don't look like horse. No, they seem to be coming here. Good morning, gentlemen. You a British officer? Uh, we are. 95th Rifles, ma'am. At your service. Thank you. My name is Victoria de los Dolores, and this is my sister, Juana Maria. Juanita. We are trying to find our friends Lord Somerset and Captain Gordon. They live in our house when the English were in Bada Horse before. Uh, this is Captain Smith. He's a friend of Gordon's. Uh, good day, ladies. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your names. Victoria de los Dolores and my sister Juanita. Uh, they're looking for Somerset and, and, and Gordon. I'm sorry to trouble you, but you well, see... I wish I knew how to help you. They could be anywhere just after a battle. An army headquarters is at least a mile from here. Oh, then tell me, please, who can help us? Yesterday, we had a house. We had clothes. We had food. Now we have nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> Two months ago, the French destroyed our farm at Olivenza... And today, the English have destroyed our house in Badajoz. And look what your soldiers have done to our ears. Oh, oh dear. They just tore our earrings out. We would have given them gladly, but they would not wait. It distresses us very much to hear it. And my sister, too. Look. They are worse than brutes, I'm afraid, when they get hold of the drink. The truth is, it may take some time to find Captain Gordon or Lord Fitzroy Somerset. Meanwhile, how can we help you, ma'am? You are British officer and honourable men. It is for that I am speaking to you. I am a married woman, and my husband is in the army of General Arizaga, but I have not heard from him for two years. I must go to Madrid to find out if he is alive or dead. That could be dangerous. For myself, I am not worried, but it is for my sister, who is only 14. Only 14? But so, I... I have to find my husband, and I must take our old maid with me, because a woman cannot travel alone. Of course. But I must find protection for my sister. Which is why I wish to speak to our friend, Lord Fistroy and Captain Gordon. Uh, certainly, we shall help you to find your friends. But meanwhile, you both need look no further for protection. I will guarantee it here and now. Uh, thank you. But when I go to Madrid... Uh, there are women belonging to the regiment who would gladly take care of your sister. Uh, she could be given a tent to herself. God knows, there are empty tents enough after last night. 
Uh, we could arrange that, couldn't we? Well, I, I don't know. It's a bit irregular. I mean, we'd like to help. Um, well, what do you think, Harry? Damsel in distress and all that? Hmm, it's not good enough. What happens if, after Senora Victoria goes, we three get killed, wounded, or otherwise dispersed? Yes. It's quite clear what has to be done. Senora Victoria, there is only one way to guarantee your sister's safety and honour for the foreseeable future. There is a way? She must marry a British officer before you go. Oh. In other words, as soon as possible. Marry? But who would want to marry me? I would. Oh, Harry, sick. Harry, old fellow. Shut up, Johnny. Juanita. My name is Harry George Wakelin Smith. I'm a captain in the Rifle Corps. I would consider it an honor if you would consent to be my wife. If you wish, we should be married immediately. Juanita. Please, Victoria. My name is Juana Maria de los Dolores de Leon. I can sew, and I can cook, and I speak good French. I am grateful for your offer of marriage, which, with my sister's permission, I accept. But Juanita... I will be a good and true wife to you as long as I live. In It's a Long Way from Talavera, the first of two linked plays by Peter Luke based on his novel The Other Side of the Hill, Michael Pennington played Arthur Wellesley, Lord Wellington, John Moffat, Major William Napier, Dominic Rickards, Captain Harry Smith, Cyril Jenkins, Juanita de los Dolores, Philip Sully, Don Julian Sanchez, and June Tobin, Madre Soledad. Major Lord Fitzroy Somerset was played by Christopher Good. Captain Alexander Gordon, David Bannerman. Corporal Prickett, Ronald Herdman. Rifleman Doubleday, Clarence Smith. Rifleman Jackman and Captain Freer, Mark Straker. Rifleman Palmer and Miguelin, Neil Roberts. Rifleman West, Eric Allen. Captain Kincaid, Terence Edmund. Captain Sula and Lieutenant Dan Cardo, Alan Barker. General Crawford, General Menacho, and Quartermaster Surtees, Brett Usher. Lieutenant O'Malley and Corporal Costello, Andrew Winkett. General Pakenham and Onyo, Colin McFarlane. Victoria, Emma Fielding. Lady Wellesley, Melanie Hudson. Sister Rosario, Teresa Stratfield. The music was composed and conducted by Tom Eastwood and performed by Paul Archibald, Richard Benjafield, Adrian Brett, Charles Dickey, Bill Worrell, and Simon Weinberg. The Other Side of the Hill was directed by Glyn Diamond. The Other Side of the Hill, two linked plays by Peter Luke based on his novel, which follows Arthur Wellesley, first Duke of Wellington, and the men and women who helped him between the years 1808 and 1814 to expel Napoleon's invading armies from the Iberian Peninsula. With Michael Pennington as Wellington, John Moffat as Major William Napier, Dominic Rickards as Captain Harry Smith, Cyril Jenkins as Juanita, Philip Sully as Don Julian Sanchez, June Tobin as Madre Soledad, and David March as Goya. In part one, Lord Wellington, as Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, laid siege to and finally took by storm the key town of Badajoz on the Portuguese border. In this, as in other battles, he had no help from the regular Spanish forces, on the contrary. Now the story is taken up by someone who not only played an active part in the Peninsular War, but who has also written the first and probably definitive history of these campaigns, 
Major, later General Sir William Napier of the 43rd Light Infantry. The Other Side of the Hill, Part 2, The Long Road to Waterloo. Let me first say that the average Spaniard made as brave a fighting soldier as I have seen on a day's march. But the generals under whom he had to serve, oh dear. General Cuesta nearly caused us to lose the Battle of Talavera. General Ariazaga threw away an army at Ocaña near Madrid. And General Imath sold the fortress town of Badajoz to the French. Little surprise, therefore, if Wellington preferred working with the gallant and effective guerrilla troops, such as those commanded by Don Julian Sanchez, alias El Charo. In his headquarters outside Badajoz, Wellington briefed the guerrilla chief before withdrawing behind the lines of Torres Vedras in Portugal. It is vital to my plan, Senor Sanchez, to have you in the Estremadura mountains straddling the French lines of communication. Marshal Marsena has many more men than I have, so I intend to stretch them and to starve them. It suits my plans equally well, Senoria. It will be my pleasure to molest him. A shot in the dark, a knife at the throat. It will not be a happy time for any French on the road to Portugal. Yes, good. But beware of your Spanish generals. As I've said before, they would rather suffer defeat than see the English winning battles on Spanish soil. One junior officer whom Wellington kept tripping over, as it were, was a friend of mine, Captain Harry Smith of the 95th Rifles. Harry had just taken part in the storming of the fortress of Badajoz, which had, to their everlasting shame, been pillaged and raped and set on fire by drunken British troops. From the ashes of the town, Harry had rescued, intact, a girl of 14 called Juanita de los Dolores de Leon. I'm Harry George Wakelin Smith. I'm a captain in the Rifle Corps, and I would consider it an honor if you would consent to be my wife. My name is Juana Maria de los Dolores de Leon. I can sew, and I can cook, and I speak good French. I will be a good and true wife to you as long as I live. Thus we left them in the 95th Rifles lines, with Badajoz burning in the background. But then an unexpected problem arose. In order for Harry to marry Juanita, a Catholic, they needed a priest. But all the clergy of Badajoz had fled with their antique bishop to the distant monastery of Guadalupe. The day was saved by a chance meeting with Don Julian Sanchez, shortly after his visit to the Commander-in-Chief. Don Julian! Don't you remember me? Juanita de los Dolores. Juanita! How could I recognize a beautiful butterfly <laughs> when I last saw her as a little grub? <laughs> Overcoming his initial surprise at Juanita's announcement that she was hoping to marry his friend Harry Smith, El Charo solved their problem by introducing them to a huge bearded guerrillero called El Fraile. who turned out to be a genuine Franciscan friar and ordained priest. Officer. Uh, did you call, sir? Where's Major Somerset? Where's Captain Gordon? Where the devil is everybody? Uh, probably the wedding, my lord. Wedding? What wedding? Who the hell has taken it into his or her head to get married while Badal is still burning? I'm not sure, my lord. I heard it was someone in the 95th. Could it be someone called Smith, sir? Smith? That fellow in the rifles, do you mean? Yes, it sounds like it. Yes, I should think that's exactly who it is. <laughs> Gentlemen, may I interrupt this wonderful party just for a moment? I would just like to drink a toast 
to Don Julio Sanchez and his shadows who have made all this possible. John Julio! And, uh, and one more toast to those friends who cannot be here today. To absent friends, may they rest in peace. Juanita, I long to kiss you. I do. But first, tell me please your name again. <laughs> that must be the most original remark ever made by a bride to her groom. <laughs> I was christened Henry. Hen Henry? Henry? Henry. Oh, Enrique. <laughs> <laughs> Harry. Explain to me how you found time during the siege of Badajoz to lay siege also to my friend, Juanita. <laughs> That's easy. I took her by storm. <laughs> <laughs> it may be a comfort to you to know, Senor Sanchez, that this morning Lord Wellington gave orders for a gallows to be erected in the main square. For the benefit of his own troops, I hope. A gallows has a very sobering effect on a certain type of Englishman. Yes, Costello? You know Patsy Cochran's widow, sir? Uh, that, that pretty girl with the donkey? That's the one, sir. Well, uh, the poor thing is very lonely, and she's a good, clean girl. And I was thinking that perhaps Mrs. Smith would need a maid servant, and they could, maybe, keep each other company when we're on service. Yeah, send her along tomorrow, Costello. Very well, sir. Pity you didn't invite the Commander-in-Chief, Harry. Oh, I didn't have the nerve. Oh, Lord Wellington loves a good party. Orderly officer. Sir? When anybody who normally works at my headquarters deigns to return to duty from weddings, balls, picnics, or whatever social engagements they're attending, Tell them that the Commander-in-Chief is in his office wasting his time because he cannot move his army without a staff. Very good, my lord. <sighs> to Miss Harriet Wilson, 22 Dover Street, London. My dear pretty little Harriet, what the devil's this I hear about you having no money? Do you not recollect when we last met that I said I feared lest you might get in some sort of scrape when I went back to Spain? Where the devil is our guile? He's certainly not out here fighting the French. So why shouldn't he pay your debts? Meanwhile, here's a draft on Coots, which is all I can afford at this moment. I remember you shed a tear when I told you I was off to Spain. I treasure the memory of that tear because there's no humbug about you. I've thought of you often enough since. Indeed, not so long ago I dreamt you came out of my staff, dressed as a light dragoon. And what a very pretty sight Harriet Wilson would have made as a light dragoon. Alas for the Peninsular Army that she never appeared thus attired. She did get Lord Wellington's letter, though. Why, here's a piece of pork and greens, Fanny. Oh, how's that, Harriet? Some money from an old bow. Tra-la-la! -la. What luck! Mine are all too mean. Well, which one is it that gives you money? Why, the great and glorious wonder of his age, Lord Wellington, no less. Well, from Spain? How does he do? Oh, he's going on famously. Thanks to his complete lack of sensibility, his indifference to bloodshed and his excellent luck. <laughs> I don't mean he has no notion about commanding an army. Au contraire, for no one has ever slaughtered so many Frenchmen. But I have to say, he cuts a poor figure in a lady's boudoir. <laughs> but God bless him all the same. He's the only one to put his hand in his pocket and expect nothing for his money. Enrique! Enrique! Uh, what is it, my love? Come 
can see. Oh, it's the French POWs. We've been holding them here in Badajoz. POWs? Prisoners of war. Where are they being taken? Oh, I don't know. The officers will probably be shipped to England to keep them out of mischief. Now, I can't imagine what it must have been like for you living under the enemy, poor darling. It improved my French. Oh, you spoke to them? Well, I had to. I worked in the town hall. And I can tell you, I learned quite a lot. What a lot we've got to learn about each other, sweetheart. <laughs> I would like you to kiss me. Uh, not here, darling. <laughs> Who's that tall fellow staring at you, Benita? Well, there. Oh! No, no, Captain. Au revoir. Who is that damn fellow? Captain Sula. He was the French officer in charge of the town hall. I worked for him. Have I reason to be jealous, Benita? <laughs> of course not. He has a wife and a little boy he loves very much. They live near Bordeaux. Oh, all the same. I'd rather it was farewell, not au revoir. But it makes me feel so sad. Ah, war's a sad business, darling. Oh, look! Here comes Johnny Kincaid, remember? Uh, yes. You met him at the wedding. He's just been made adjutant. Hello, Johnny. Hello. Ah, you look a bit put out, old fellow. What's up? I've just seen the Frencher who gave me this horse. A bit embarrassing, really. Ah, fortunes of war, old boy. <laughs> That's not what I came to see you about. Uh, um... Uh, oh, uh, would you excuse us, darling? Johnny and I need to talk shop. I need to help Jenny Cochrane tidy up the tent. There's a spot of bother, Harry. What? Well, it just happens that our friend Sanchez is a close friend, or perhaps relative, I don't know, of the mother superior of the convent in Badajoz. And? Some of the nuns were raped. I wouldn't put anything past the 3rd Division. 3rd Division were not in that sector of the town. Oh. Well, who was it, then? I company. Your old 13 platoon. Damn their eyes! Why can't they ever keep out of trouble? I'm afraid it's serious, Harry. You see, the Mother Superior, Madre Soledad, is not just any old nun. She's something to do with British intelligence. Do you know what my nuns are praying for, Julian? <laughs> I have little Latin, Madre. They're asking for something they can never have, poor things. They're praying for the restoration of their chastity. I'm sorry, I never normally we. If I could have got my men into the town sooner. Oh, you did what you could. Well, I better get on with the cleaning up. You mop like a real professional. Oh, I, I did enough when I was a novice. You never saw such a mess. They even defecated in the chapel. Good God. But I suppose cleaning it all up is a good exercise in humility. The English are more brutish than the French. To defile God's house. It is they themselves who are defiled. They'd all be hanged if I had anything to do with it. Oh, we have forgiven them already, Julian. But what do I do if any of my nuns are pregnant? There is nothing in canon law to cover that. I cannot forgive myself for not getting here earlier. Oh, it has happened to thousands. Which is something that all of us who take the veil are prepared to suffer in Christ's name. Any news from Monsignor Curtis? None of our Irish friends have been able to get through. But I'll know when we get to Salamanca. Monsignor Curtis, principal of the Irish College in Salamanca, was the centre of Lord Wellington's intelligence service in northern Spain. Madre Soledad in Barajoz and Julian Sanchez in the mountains west of Salamanca were two other elements of it. With the Barajoz area cleared of the French, Salamanca was our commander-in-chief's next objective. With the army on the march again, Harry Smith had his duties to occupy him. Juanita, new to campaigning, was put together with Jenny Cochran in the baggage train in charge of Rifleman West, Harry's soldier servant and groom. Harry's charger was a reliable animal I once owned called Old Chap, but he had a reserve horse a fiery little chestnut thoroughbred called Chiquito. This is a dull creature to ride, Waste. Oh, no, ma'am. 
He's a poor thing we picked up in Portugal for baggage. But this paddy I'm on wouldn't be no good to you. He's got a nice nature, but he doesn't know where to put his feet. What about Chiquito? Oh, well, Chiquito's a thoroughbred. You're talking about a full horse who just wants to go. We'd never see you again, missus, if we put you on him. in his little tent. Oh, I'm so happy, sweetheart. <laughs> Enrique? Yes, my love? Who is that fair lady I often see riding? She looks very pleased with herself. Fair lady? Oh, you mean Lady Wargrave? Uh, does she ride a store braid? Oh, sure to. Her husband commands a cavalry regiment. What is the difference between a thoroughbred and any other horse? A thoroughbred is a strong and beautiful animal with a mind and a will of its own that needs a skilled and bold rider to get the best out of him. By comparison, an ordinary hack is little more than a vehicle. <laughs> so, I am riding a vehicle? Uh, well, in a sense. But when you've had more experience... I can ride Chiquito. Well... Uh, not Chiquito, but, um... He is a Spaniard like me, Enrique. We would understand each other. Perhaps you would, too. You're a little thoroughbred yourself. <laughs> and you like riding. Hey, now, haven't we seen you before somewhere? Perhaps. Uh, I've got a feeling you're the young lady what married one of our officers. Oh, yes, I am. Harry Smith. Oh, come again. Please. Uh, what name did you say? Harry Smith. Oh, oh yes. Mrs. Smith. <laughs> this is Mrs. Smith. <laughs> you're making fun of me, no? I'm oh, sorry, ma'am. No disrespect intended. They're a wicked lot, the lads of 13 pretend, oh, and they do like to have a bit of fun. Oh, yeah. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, senores. You are my husband's platoon, no? You can yeah. say we're pretty well known to Mr. I beg his pardon, Captain <laughs> Smith. <laughs> he must be missing us now he's been promoted. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure when he goes to bed at night, he says, Oh, what well, hope Paul Pongo Cricket and Billy Doubleday are all right. Shut up. When he wakes up in the morning, he says, Oh, what the hell, Sniper Jack with a bulletproof bomber off today? Danny he miss, eh? Yeah, now, now, Jack, man, that'll do. <laughs> hey, but I'm going to make some introductions, Mrs. Smith. Seeing as how we're going to be campaigning together. Now, that there's Rifleman Sniper Jackman. Bit of jail bait, if ever there was one. I do. <laughs> yeah, and that sorrowful looking creature is Rifleman Billy Doubleday. <laughs> oh, Keep your hand on your small chain when he's around. <laughs> Oh, hey, and that's Rifleman Palmer, otherwise known as the bomb-proof man, because he's so thick, no weapon invented will go through him. Hey, no, 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 sorry, missus. <laughs> and you, senor, who are you? Oh, Tell the lady the oh. truth, Congo. <laughs> oh, no. I'm Sergeant Prickett. No, Sergeant oh. mine. No common rifleman like this here. Hey, rifleman! Best man in the army! <laughs> Getting to know you all better. Perhaps you would like it if I cook for you one day. Oh, well, that's an awful wee bit silly to refuse, I like it. Hey, what can you cook, missus? I could make you a good puchero, maybe. Oh, what's that, then, lady? It's stew, dumb man. Oh, hey, Mrs. Smith's gonna cook us up a stew. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I can hear something else and all. There is thunder, yes? No, Mrs. Smith, that's off thunder. It's something you'll hear plenty more of now you're up the sharp end with the rifle. What is it? That's gunfire, Mrs. Smith. Boney has gone to Russia. Across the Dnieper on the 12th of June. A bit late in the year, isn't it, my lord? Hmm. All the more chance for him to catch a bad cold. Fighting a war on two fronts? That's not a good idea, is it, sir? No, don't underestimate the Corsican, Fitzroy. 
I've always told myself that in case I ever met him face to face. Although that seems unlikely now. Any orders, my lord? Yes. Find out if there are any fords over the rivers Agadon and the Tormets. Oh. So you intend to... Take Salamanca. See my old friend, Monsignor Curtis, there. Here, talking of the religious, <clears throat> it's been reported that the convent in Badahoth was desecrated. Some nuns raped. If I find out who did it, I'll hang them. The provost marshal is looking into it, General. Let him look sharp. Sweetheart, answer me, please. <laughs> Darling, I can't bear it. Tell me what's happened. What's that in your hand? A, a gold medal? Read! Read the back! Rosario Gaiare, 12th of May, 1809. Sister Rosario, my best friend at the convent. Did she give it to you? I still don't understand, darling. A wedding present. A wedding present? Who from? I don't know. Some soldier from... from your platoon. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Darling, dry your eyes now. We're moving on. Come on, you're in the army now. Yes, I am in the army. Sweet Mary, Mother of God, I know harm I've come to Sister Rosario. <gasps> in our approach march to Salamanca, in crossing the Agada River, we were hit by a storm of incredible ferocity. Several cavalry horses were killed by lightning. Many bolted. Come, Mrs. Fulham! Mrs. Tent's up in case it comes on the rain again. Thank you, West. Oh, the captain's coming now. You get inside. I'll go and get his horse. Then I'll try and find Jenny Cochran. She and her burrow probably got held up on a river. I had rather have her burrow than that pig of a Portuguese horse. West? Here we are, sir. <sighs> Madam's inside and uh, not very happy with the day's events. Oh, uh... Oh, dear. Uh, thank you, West. Hello, darling. <laughs> Johnny Kincaid's been telling me you've had your baptism of fire today. Fire? What's that to me? Fire? I was nearly thrown by that cow of a horse, and I'm never going to ride him again. Never! Uh, why? Uh, what happened, darling? You think I like to look like an imbecile in front of the whole brigade? He's bad enough looking like a peasant woman going to market on that Portuguese object, while Lady Walgrave swaggers by on a thoroughbred. From now on, I ride Chiquito, or I walk. Well, it's, uh, it's funny you mention that, because I had a word with the Royal Horse Artillery Saddler, and he's come up with something rather clever. What are you talking about? Look in that sack. Enrique! 
a side saddle. And I'll tell Wes to put it on Chiquito when we march in the morning. Oh, Enrique, <laughs> I oh. love you so much. Oh. <laughs> On the morning of the 22nd of July, 1812, the French and British armies were facing each other east of Salamanca, where two hills called the Arapiles dominated the terrain. For reasons unknown, young Marshal Marmont was performing a series of inexplicable manoeuvres which Lord Wellington was watching intently while refreshing himself with a chicken leg. What do you see, Alex? I see... Uh... I see a gap between the French left and the centre. Yes. I think they may have overextended themselves, my lord. Give me the glass. Yes, sir. My God, Alex, that'll do. Is General Packenham here? I'm here, my lord. Ned, you see those fellows on the left-hand hill? I do. Throw your third division at them and send them to the devil. Yes, sir. Pierced run away nearly a whole chicken leg. Soft and friendlies, them's ours, missus. The loud and nasties, them's theirs, coming our way. You soon get to know the difference, ma'am. I can tell already, Jenny. The nasties are getting nastier every minute. Oh. <laughs> His lordship likes to get started early so he can get through by supper time. Do you think the captain will be back by supper time? Oh, I know how you must be feeling, ma'am. I know the waiting and waiting and waiting for the battle be over and, and then to see who it is doesn't come back. I'm sorry. I never knew your husband, yeah. Patsy Cochran was a good man, although he took a drop sometimes. He was having one when the ball got him, uh, right through his calabash into his head. Fuentes de Onoro it was. They buried him at Fuentes. I'm sorry. It's nice you're a Catholic, ma'am. Thank God there's a God or there'd be precious little comfort in the world. What's happening up there now? We're advancing by the sound of things. Do you think it would be all right for me to exercise Chiquito? Just round the baggage lines, ma'am. Good. You know what, missus? It's not the captain, begging his pardon, that's taught you to ride. I reckon it's Chiquito. Lord Wellington, sir. Yes, Smith, what can I do for you? Uh, General Vandeleur of the First Light Brigade says, are there any orders for him? No, sir. You may tell General Vandeleur with my compliments to stand down. It's all over by the shouting. We'll be in Salamanca for breakfast. Hello. What's this, though? Oh, my God. A pretty gal on a chestnut pony on the battlefield. Do you see that, Alex? Indeed I do, sir. Do you see Harry? Yes. Hold hard there! That lady on the chestnut... You're riding into hounds, ma'am. Be so good as to leave the field. She's pulled up. She's waving to us. Oh, my God. Pretty girl, Alex. Wonder who she is. Your face is very red, Smith. Caught the sun, have you? To the Right Honourable, the Lord Bathurst, Whitehall, London, my lord. In reply to your recent letter, when you asked if the army in the peninsula was tired of success, I reminded your lordship that an army occasionally needs rest, good food, and a making up of arrears of pay, all of which have been greatly lacking in recent campaigns. Now I am pleased to acquaint your lordship with the news that despite lack of the above, a decisive victory has been won at Salamanca, which will open our road to Madrid. There were no mistakes, all went as it ought, and never was an army beaten in so short a time. It is unfortunate that our men are in rags. I remain, my lord, your humble and obedient servant, Wellington, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in the Peninsula. After his victory at Salamanca, the peer had a difficult decision to make. Whether to pursue the French in their withdrawal towards the Pyrenees, or to occupy Madrid, where lay the heart of the Spanish people. He decided to march on Madrid. It was a good decision for everybody's morale. I'm wondering, Fitzroy, how the good citizens of Madrid are going to receive us? As foreign invaders or liberating allies? We look more like beggars, my lord. Huh. The red coats are brown, 
The green jacket's grey, and there's not a man without a patch on his trousers. And as for the boots... Oh, well, we are just coming to the Paseo de Castellana, my lord. The main avenue into the city. Thank you, Alex. I hope, Fitzroy, you gave orders for the green jackets to come last. I did, my lord. No one that had gone fox trotting in and messing up all the others. Poor old rifles. First into battle, last into the flesh pots. Oh, I am so excited, Enrique. I've never been to Madrid before. Stand your front! Rifle! Bring it! Here we go now. By the left! Quick! March! Oh, look at them bleeding carnation sleeves. <laughs> Wouldn't get them in the mall then, bro. Hey, Pongo? Dead cats, more like. <laughs> yeah, I spy some very lovely grumble and grunt over yonder. Ooh. Ooh. Cool. You dark-eyed senoritas. Wait for Billy Doubleday. <laughs> See you later, my darling. Get stuck in. You're posted. <laughs> Not a lovesick bloody vampire. Oh, that's that's us. <laughs> oh look at that one there. The city seems to have gone mad with delight. Yes. <laughs> How do you like being an honorary bullfighter, my lord? <laughs> Very well. <laughs> so long as they don't expect me to wear those fancy clothes. There's another rout tonight, sir. Oh, who's it this time? General Lowry Cole. Ah! Of all my senior officers, Lowry Cole gives the best parties. <laughs> Come on, Juanita. Let's go and talk to General Vandeleur before he drains the punch bowl. <laughs> ah, Juanita, Harry, good party, eh? Um, Harry, be so good as to get your wife and me a glass of punch. Of course, sir. Let's sit down, Juanita. Thank you, General. I've done enough of standing lately. You probably haven't met our host, Larry Cole. Only to shake hands. Hmm. Well, you see, he's another Irishman. And we Irishmen know all about each other. You might be interested to know that Larry Cole was at one time engaged to Kitty Pakenham. Kitty Pakenham? Lady Wellington, as she is now. Ah. Oh. That was in Ireland before the peer came back from India. What happened? Oh, it was all arranged in a very gentlemanly fashion. I dare say Larry might say to himself that he got the best of the bargain. But why? There's no secret about it. The Wellingtons don't get on too well. His lordship is a good mathematician, and Kitty can never balance her household accounts. It drives him mad. <laughs> anyway, when all's said and done, it seems to suit the peer to be away campaigning most of the time. Talk of the devil. Vandeleur. My lord. And? Oh, uh, may I present Mrs. Harry Smith. Uh, Mrs. Smith, Lord Wellington. How do you do, Mrs. Smith? I... I think I know your face. Oh, dear. Yes. Tell me, Mrs. Smith, do you by any chance ride a small chestnut horse? <laughs> yes, I thought as much. Well, I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, but never let me see you again on a field of battle. <laughs> now, let us take a glass of wine together. Or perhaps you prefer punch? Tell me, Juanita, are you by any chance free tomorrow morning? I'll uh, tell you why I ask. I have been forced to submit to having my portrait painted. And as you can imagine, this is a very boring operation for me, and I would be greatly obliged if you would keep me company for an hour or so while this is being done. With pleasure, my lord. Who is the painter? Oh, grumpy little chap, called Goya. Don Francisco Goya? Yes, he was court painter here, I believe. You know him. Me? No. I don't know him. But what Spaniard has not heard of him? Oh, no, Senor Goya. Will that pose do? How is that? Will that do for You'll the have pose? to speak up. I am rather deaf. I said, will this pose do? Any pose will do. All poses are equal to me. I am only concerned with people, and people are best as they are, not posing. Yes, quite so. How's that? 
I said quite so. They owed me well enough the Battle of Salamanca, sir. Salamanca? You mean the Battle of Los Arapiles? I don't give a damn what you Spaniards choose to call it. As far as I'm concerned, it's Salamanca. I always heard the English were obstinate and insular. Yes, when it so happens, I'm not English, I'm Irish. I always heard the Irish were mad. I don't know where you get your information from. Oh, please, from, please, please, keep still. How can I paint if you keep jerking about? And take that disagreeable expression off your face. Unless you always look like that. What? You talk of battles. I have the noise of battle in my ears all the time. Well, it might help if I had somebody to talk to who can hear me. Look, would you object if I sent for one of my staff so I could work while I'm sitting here? Oh, if you want to work, that is good. We will both be occupied, and that will make it easier for me to concentrate on a very dull subject. I beg your pardon, sir. I don't mean to insult you, but one soldier in uniform is much like another. In your case, what is interesting is that you have a red face from being exposed to the sun, but your forehead, where your hat has been, is completely white. A good painter should be able to make the dullest subject interesting. You should see what I did to our former royal family, my famous group portrait of our erstwhile monarch and his relatives. Nothing in the head of any of them but vanity. And that is how I painted them. <laughs> they were delighted. Yes, well, vanity is common to most human beings, Senor Goya. Do you not suffer from it at all? Of course I do. Oh, and pray what form does it take? Women. I am vain about my ability to conquer women, <laughs> particularly so as I am short, fat, and not at all well born. Yes, well, you have a sound technique, no doubt. A painter has many techniques, and I don't include flattery. Ah, far too obvious. But painting a portrait is a very intimate and sensual undertaking, and one where, on occasion, a very special relationship can, I repeat, can grow rapidly between painter and sitter. Women, when they condescend or choose to be painted, tend after a while to expose themselves. And I don't mean just taking off their clothes, that silly macha naked business, old rubbish. It got me into quite serious trouble with the Inquisition. As I was saying... Uh, did, did you hear a knock? Huh? A knock at your front door. If there was, I expect my servant will let in, whoever it is. As I was saying, it is partly a question of intimacy. The painter and his sitter have been many hours alone together, sometimes talking, sometimes not. She says to herself, you are engrossed with me. Take me, make free of me, I trust you. <laughs> You would be surprised, General, how many women, beautiful women, who I paint on canvas, ask me to adorn their faces. I mean, cosmetically, to rouge their lips and shape their eyebrows. Please forgive me, my lord. Oh. We were so late last night and I overslept. I am so sorry. Oh, say no more, Juanita. Um, Senor Goya and I have been having a very interesting conversation and one not at all suitable for your ears. <laughs> Now, let me introduce a, a fellow countrywoman to you, sir. This is my little guerrillera from Badahoff, and I absolutely forbid you to paint her. How do you do, senor? <laughs> oh, you are beginning to look more animated already, General. Oh, I should think so, with such a charming companion to talk to. Yeah, I hear, Juanita, your husband's gone as brigade major to General Vandeleur. Uh, that is so, my lord. Are you really a guerrillera, senor? Oh, no. My husband's in the British Army, but my sister Victoria is a guerrillera. She's with Don Julian Sanchez. El Charo, eh? Huh? Tell me, how can a young lady of good family survive the rough life of a partisan? <laughs> the rough life? They think they live better than the regular army. Oh, oh that could well be... Particularly since the British government has a great reluctance to feed, clothe, or pay its troops. And how did your sister come to be with El Charo? Her husband, Jacinto Orellana, was in the army that was defeated by the French at Ocania. And he has been missing ever since. Two years nearly. El Charo cannot help find him? He has tried, and so has Captain Gordon. But there is no news from the Spanish or the British. Yes, it's a sorry business. No, people say I regard war as a field sport, but I, perhaps better than anyone, know what a sad business it really is. Oh, dear. Now you are looking disagreeable again. From Madrid, the peer was faced with too many alternatives. 
With General Hill containing King Joseph and Marshal Soult in the south, Lord Wellington finally decided to take his Madrid troops northwards to recapture the important city of Burgos. Major Smith, sir. General Vandeleur's compliments and he would like to see you immediately. Come in, Harry. Ah, filthy weather. Yes, foul, sir. Harry, I've been posted. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Well, as you know, I'm a cavalry man by trade, and, and I'm to command 16th Cavalry Brigade. Who's taking over from you, sir? Uh, General Skirret. Oh, no. Well, he's got a record of personal bravery. But everybody knows he's a timid commander, and unable to make up his mind. That's why the guards got rid of him. I'm sorry, Harry, but I have to obey orders. And so do you. But believe me, I've thoroughly enjoyed being with you, Light Bobs. Some military historians have been critical about the peers' move north against Burgos. He was none too happy about it himself. Lord Bathurst, Whitehall. A severe but temporary reverse. My failure to take Burgos, a heavily fortified city for which I take sole responsibility, was occasioned by the early onset of the rainy season. In order to prevent the town being reinforced by King Joseph's army from the south, I proceeded against it without my heavy siege train, which had been left for various reasons on the Tagus. Burgos turned out to be impregnable without the heavy artillery, but by this time it was too late to bring it up. It is now my intention to withdraw behind the river Agada and, if circumstances permit, go into winter quarters. How did you like this stew, my friend? Oh, good, miss. Very satisfying. Yeah, very tasty. <laughs> but them beans... You are all dosing. Beans will make you fat. Well, I don't know about fat. Well, certainly make you fat. <laughs> you mean... It was a bad winter from every point of view. To cross the river Agada in full spate with the French hard on our tail was no easy matter. General Skerritt, sir. Mm. Message from the divisional commander. Shall I read it? Yes, Smith. It is my belief that the enemy will make every endeavour to possess himself of the bridge on your front before daylight. All precautions must therefore be taken to prevent him doing so. Well? May I suggest, sir, that we do what the brigade usually does under the circumstances? What's that? Put the whole battalion of the 95th into the houses this side of the bridge, and have the 52nd close by to back them if necessary. What? Ridiculous. It's only a small bridge. Who are there now? One very understrength company of the 95th under Captain Cardo, sir. Well, if your regiment's as good as it's always saying it is, that should be quite sufficient. Uh, may I not refer the matter to Colonel Barnard, who commands the 95th? If I thought it necessary to refer to Colonel Barnard, I should do so myself. But, General, we're to hold the bridge under all circumstances. We've had a direct order. I am well aware of what is or what is not an order. Damn your eyes, General. You'll lose the picket and the bridge. Damn your eyes, sir. That's insubordination. This will mean a court-martial for you. Or you, sir. The odds are on you. Consider yourself under arrest. Another friend of mine in the rifles was Daniel Cardo. A very decent fellow, but very much the beau or dandy of those days. Harry couldn't stand him. It was Dan Cardo who commanded the detachment guarding the bridge. If French is almost bound to attack, wouldn't you say so, Fair? They need the bridgehead. Mm. Just a question of when, that's all. Can't imagine why we haven't been reinforced. Harry Smith knows the drill, even if the new gentleman doesn't. Could you do with a drop of rum? Hmm, that would be very welcome. Colour Sergeant, any chance of conjuring up a drop of Demerara? I've just issued the last of the rum rations, sir. Oh, dear. Oh, well. But I kept a few tots back for HQ. Oh, good fellow, Colour. Mm. If I have to meet my maker, I'll have to put up with a little lick on my breath. <laughs> Do you wish?
wish to see General Skerritt, my lord? No, Fitzroy. I want nothing to do with a blackguard. You will not punish him, my lord? One company of the 95th held that bridge to the last man on the last round. A totally unnecessary operation which could easily have been averted. Were they wiped out? Almost. Except for a little chap called Freer and two or three men. What punishment could I possibly give him that would bring those gallant fellows back? Find some excuse to send him to Lisbon. We'll ship him back to England when we can. What about Smith, sir? He's technically under arrest. Smith, Smith, Smith. Why am I always bedeviled by that damn fellow? Oh, tell his colonel to drop the charge. But let it be known in no uncertain terms, Fitzroy, that he must learn to control his temper if he aspires to become a general. Sweetheart, don't be so sad, please. This is the first night for a week we have caught up with our little tent. Isn't it cozy? You know, darling, Dan Cardo was my friend too. We used to laugh so much together. You didn't mind that I like to be friends with Dan? No, sweetheart. But what I can't stomach is that Dan went gallantly to his death thinking that I had let him down. He may even, God forbid, have thought that I did it on purpose. No, sweet. It is not like that. Where Dan is now, he will know the truth. I wish I could be sure. I am sure. Unfortunately, that's not all. You remember that rather flashy ring Dan used to wear? Yes. After the affair at the bridge on the Agada, Dan's body was found with the ring finger chopped off. Oh, God. Everybody thought it was the French when they overran his company. It wasn't? The ring was offered for sale last week to somebody in the foot guards. Oh. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, the person to whom the ring was offered happened by chance to know Dan and recognised it. Oh, God. Who did it? As president of this court-martial, I will now read out the findings of the court. One. For receiving goods knowing them to be stolen and for attempting to sell them for his own gain, Sergeant A. R. Prickett, of the 1st Battalion, 95th Rifles, is sentenced to be reduced to the ranks with ignominy. Two. For the much more serious offence of mutilating the dead body of an officer from his own regiment and for stealing from that body various items of value for his own gain, Rifleman W. Doubleday of the 1st Battalion, 95th Rifles, is sentenced to 500 lashes of the cat and nine tails The lenience of this sentence is due to the fact that ownership of other valuable objects of a religious nature found on or about the accused person could not be proven. Sergeant Costello, who as a corporal was wounded at Badajoz, bore witness to the execution of the sentence on Rifleman Doubleday. The whole battalion was formed for the punishment in a field close to our camp. There was a tree in the centre to which the culprit was to be tied, and close to which he stood with folded arms and downcast eyes. Surgeon Boker stood by while the buglers were busily engaged untying the strings of the cat. Poor Billy Doubleday, under the eyes of the whole regiment, looked deadly pale. That countenance that had faced the fiercest battle was now blanched in dread of a worse fate. For a moment, he tried with an imploring glance to catch the colonel's eye. The colonel betrayed much uneasiness. He had no stomach for flogging, but he knew his duty and with a stern voice ordered the punishment to begin. The first bugle bestowed his quantum, 25 lashes, and was succeeded by another and another. 
Billy's sufferings were intense. He bit his lips to stifle the utterances of his pangs. But nature was too strong for him, and he gave out more than once an agonized cry that seemed to penetrate to the very blood in my veins. One hundred. Two hundred. The lashes continued in this way, till on Billy's back, no skin could be seen for blood and pulped flesh. Some of which spattered upon the surgeon, who was obliged to withdraw a pace or two. At the 301st lash, the colonel ordered the flogging to cease, and the prisoner taken down. So ended an unforgettable punishment. Please God, I never witness another. Hello there, Ted Costello. Where have you been all the days? Ah, uh, I've been awful busy, Jenny. How are you since? Oh, not so bad. Soldiering on, you know. <laughs> that was a terrible business about poor Billy Doubleday. It was. But it was no more than he deserved. He got off lightly. Lightly? Five hundred lashes. The colonel stopped punishment at three hundred. That's not what I'm saying. What's that then? They found a lot of other stuff in his pack: a chalice, a silver cross, uh, some gold medals, and the like. <gasps> What's the matter, Jenny? I'm just minded of something. What? Well, one day, soon after they were married, somebody left a gold medal of Our Lady as a wedding present for my missus. Who left it? Billy Doubleday. I don't know. Nobody saw him. There was a name engraved on the back. Oh. It was um. Oh yes, uh, Rosie Gary or something like that. Rosario Gayari is one of Mrs. Smith's friends, a nun who was raped in Badajoz. Oh my God. Not a word, Jenny. That must be a secret between us, forever. No one will hear it from my lips. The least of all your messes. Oh, the poor darling. Swear it, Jenny. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, on your holy names, I swear it. There now, Jenny. Have you noticed anything about me? <laughs> yes, you're as ugly as ever. Look at me arm. <laughs> oh, Janey Mac, you've been made up sergeant. Well, it makes a big difference on payday, so. It would surely. You know what I was thinking, Jenny. With my pay and your wages, well, what I'm saying is, Jenny, you need someone to look after you, and I'm the man for the job. That is, if you'll have me. Will you marry me, Jenny? There, now I've said it. Well. Best thanks to you, Ted, and there's no better, no kinder man in the regiment. Nor in the whole wide world itself. Ah, but no, I could never marry again. Not a soldier, I couldn't. Not after what I went through for Pat. And they killed him in the end, didn't they? And if I married you, sure to God they'd kill you too. And I couldn't go through that again. I understand. I understand and respect the honest way you're after telling me what's in your heart. Let's just say that maybe, if we're both spared, maybe one day you'll change your mind. I'll be saying strong prayers for that. In May of 1813, the peer, recently elected generalissimo of all Allied troops in the peninsula, opened his final offensive in Spain. Opposing him was King Joseph Bonaparte. Who had unwisely placed himself at the head of two French armies? These, by mid-June, were concentrated in the neighbourhood of the town of Vitoria, a road junction just south of the seaport of Bilbao. Lord Wellington's plan was a bold one: a huge outflanking movement through the mountains to the north. It succeeded beyond any of our wildest dreams. 
The battle over, the troops immediately set about seizing the vast quantities of loot left by the French army. The best rear guard to a beaten army, Alex, is the loot they leave behind. Not much chance of an effective pursuit now. Hmm. Seems that King Joseph has systematically plundered the whole of Spain. Fitzroy says they found a number of works by Velasquez. Have they indeed? Do you know one called the water cellar? I can't say I do, sir. Hmm. Look very well on the wall of my house. You there, Sergeant! Get your men and march those prisoners back to brigade. I want to talk to that officer there. Very good, sir. You, sir. Are you in command of this lot? I was. I've not seen that uniform before. Are you Spanish? Yes. King Joseph's guards. Never heard of them. Where do you come from? We're Spanish, taken at the Battle of Arcania. What does that signify? We were offered the choice, either be sent as prisoners to the island of Cabrera and be left to starve, or form a Spanish regiment under King Joseph. What would you have done? I certainly wouldn't change my green jacket for that pale blue affair of yours. Why not? Joseph is the legitimate king of Spain. Napoleon's brother, legitimate? There he is! <laughs> Hold hard! Julian Sanchez, what are you doing here? Looking for him. You've got the man I want, Harry. Major, I'm your prisoner. Take no notice of these men. They're bandits. Who is he? He's your brother-in-law, Harry. My brother-in-law? Jacinto Oriana, victorious husband. A damn turncoat and a daughter. My God. Yes. I'm Aureliana, but I'm your prisoner, Major. These people are cutthroats. They don't know the rules of war. Alcheroni's men respect the rules of war. But traitors, they kill. Now! Get that horse, son! Get him! Ah! God damn it! You've shot my prisoner! I shot a prisoner trying to escape. All according to the rules of war. You tell me that man's my brother-in-law one minute and you shoot him the next, damn it! I say Victoria and Juanita a grave embarrassment, Harry. Jacinto Reliana comes from Santee. The same village as I do. I've known him all my life. And I can tell you, that man was long overdue dead. Yours is a terrible story, Victoria. Terrible. Yet, in some ways, wonderful. Particularly if it has led you to think about the religious life. I cannot think of any other sort of life, Reverend Mother. You say that now. You may not always want the cloister. <laughs> I want it with all my heart. Perhaps Julian Sanchez was not altogether to blame. I have always known him to be an honorable man. I don't know what to believe. War coarsens people. I don't even know what I wish to believe. The sisters and I will pray for you, for Julian, and for the soul of your husband, Jacinto. Oh, thank you, Madre. You have been a mother to Juanita and me in more senses than one. It was my promise to your own dear mother, who was my best friend. But now I have a pleasant surprise for you. You know some of our sisters were violated after the siege by British troops. Mm, I heard. It was the one thing everybody dreaded. Well, one of them in particular received a special dispensation from the bishop to return home for a while. Now she is back with us. Come in. Victoria, oh, dear, is Victoria. Rosario. Oh, the little baby. How oh, sweet. Oh, look, he's got blue eyes and fair hair. Hardly surprising under the circumstances. Oh, oh look, he's smiling. It's probably only wind. <laughs> so, Sister Rosario, the good news is that when I have had a word with His Grace the Bishop, and I don't anticipate any problem, Victoria will start her novitiate here with us. <laughs> oh, Victoria, that's wonderful news. A year should give her time enough to decide whether she wants to become a nun or not. Oh. Meanwhile, perhaps uh, she could help you with the baby. Oh. Thank you, Reverend Mother. And what news of little Juanita, Victoria? Oh, only good news. And just imagine, she's become a great favorite with me, Lord Wellington. To 
the Right Honourable the Lord Bathurst, Whitehall, my lord, following upon our decisive victory at Vittoria, our right flank has pursued the enemy into the Pyrenees, where the latter are continuing to fight a stiff rearguard action. On our left, after a hard fight, San Sebastian has fallen to our forces, and I'm happy to inform your lordship that our leading troops have finally crossed the border into French territory. Shaving water, Millard. Oh, yes, put it down, won't you? Very good, Millard. Uh, uh, there's your razor as well, sir. Thank you. Have I any official functions today, Alex? The uh, prefecture, sir? Oh, my God, so I have. Yeah, Alex? What's that? I cannot remember whether you did or did not claim the acquaintance in London of a certain Miss Harriet Wilson. <laughs> Most certainly not, my lord. Oh, well, then you won't be interested. <laughs> it's my uh, job to be interested, sir. Uh, I recently received a rather curious letter from that young lady. It's over there on my desk. You uh, want me to read it, sir? Just have a look at the second page. You will, I rather fancy... Be surprised when I tell your lordship that I'm about to become an author. You are surprised? Of course, but you must believe me. Under the auspices of the well-known bookseller, Mr Stockdale, I'm about to publish my delectable memoirs. Moreover, I'm informed that the whole of London is trembling with expectancy at the event. Uh, ain't it droll that little Harriet Wilson should cause such a stir? <laughs> but what fun! All the nobility and gentry, that is, those who are not with your lordship in the peninsula, have been battering down my front door in an endeavour to find out whether their names are mentioned in my little book. Would you call it blackmail, my lord? I certainly would. And uh, what will you reply? Alex, Napoleon has retreated from Moscow, and we have won a great victory over the French in Spain. Is the world going to convulse still further at the publication of the memoirs of Miss Harriet Wilson? I hardly think so, sir. Right. I shall say publish and be damned. Good for you, sir. What's all that din going on out there? Go and see, will you, Alex? Forgive the lack of ceremony, my lord, but I have extraordinary news for you. Yeah, I've heard it. I've long expected it. We have peace, have we not? I don't know about that, my lord, but Napoleon's abdicated. Abdicated? There, you made me cut myself. Abdicated, you say? Yes, sir. Upon mine honour! Hurrah! With the Battle of Toulouse in April 1814, the war effectively ended, and the Spanish and Portuguese forces with their camp followers returned to their homelands. Likewise, the British troops made their way to Bordeaux to embark for England. Now, what went on in Lord Wellington's mind with peace having been declared? Could he possibly have contemplated a life by the fireside with Kitty? Unlikely. My friend Harry Smith had no plans beyond introducing his Spanish bride to his family in Cambridgeshire. However, their home leave was not to be of long duration. In March 1815, that old fox Napoleon, actually he was still only 45, escaped from Elba and raised his standard in the south of France. His old troops rallied to him, and by June of that year, he was in Belgium, confronting a scratch international army commanded by General Wellington, now elevated to a dukedom. Supporting the duke was a Prussian force under General von Blücher, the Smiths were once again on active service, Harry having been posted as Brigade Major to General Sir John Lambert, commanding 6th Division. And, of course, that old campaigner Juanita, now at least 16, wasn't going to be left behind. Enrique, why do I have to go back to Antwerp? Because it has been decreed that that is where the baggage has to go. And you're a baggage. <laughs> Very funny. But why can't I come as far as Divisional Headquarters? Because there's almost certainly going to be a big battle. 
And if the Duke catches you in the front line again, he'll never ask you to any more of his balls, picnics or parties, ever. I'm not going to ask you to dance, Juanita, because I may have to leave soon, but take my arm and let us circulate. With pleasure, Your Grace. Now, who do you know here? There seem to be many people from England I don't know. Oh, they're the Richmond's fashionable friends. The Duke and Duchess have made Brussels all the rage this year. And are those what you call English roses, sitting there all in a row? <laughs> yes, and I'm making them all fearfully jealous by promenading with you. <laughs> oh, how lovely. Ah, Napier. You know my little guerrillera from Badajoz, don't you? Indeed I do, Your Grace. Good evening, Juanita. Good evening, Major Napier. Oh, look, there's Slender Billy. Prince William of Orange. Used to be one of my ADCs in the peninsula. Commands all the Belgian and Dutch forces now. Wasn't he engaged to be married to your Princess Charlotte? Mm, turned him down, poor fellow. Just didn't fancy him. <laughs> Can't really say I blame him. <laughs> Harry? Hello, Alex, old boy. Yeah, take a glass of wine with me. Uh, no, thanks. Listen. All military personnel are to return to their units, but not all at once and not obviously, if you know what I mean. Bony spies could be in this ballroom. Right. Where's the Commander-in-Chief? Looking at maps in the library. He's going to stay to the last moment so as not to give the game away. I follow. Pass the word round discreetly, like a good fellow. Hmm. I was just beginning to enjoy the party, damn it. I hate balls. Always end up drinking too much. It's all Benita's fault. Can't get her away from the dance floor. She's getting spoiled, the baggage. If the Duke called her his little guerrillero once, he did it a dozen times. Oh. Oh. Now the bloody rain's got to my saddle. Damn it! Harry Smith was present at the Battle of Quatre Bras, when von Brucher's Prussians got a trouncing, but not an outright defeat. That was on the 17th of June, 1815. Rather late the following morning, Sunday the 18th, the rain cleared away, leaving the cold, hungry and sodden armies facing each other with little stomach for a fight. It was, nevertheless, the morning of what we now call the Battle of Waterloo. Harry was dispatched by his divisional commander to make contact with the Duke. Ah, the party started. I dare say we shall get every delicacy of the season today. Hello? There's old Scavell, the quartermaster general. Having trouble with his horse, by the looks of it. You there, sir! You in the rifles! Oh, confound the bloody animal! You'll find the bank less steep just here, sir. Thank you. Come up, you bloody animal! Confound you! Is the baggage clear back there, can you tell me? Uh, no, sir, I'm afraid not. They're pretty well blocking the Hain Road. Confound it. The Duke will make a meal of me if he can't get his reserves up. Where is the Duke, sir? Hougamont. Those farm buildings, you can just see them on the skyline. Hougamont's taking a pounding. But it always looks worse from a distance. Guards Brigade there? Ah. Trust old Nosy to be at the sharpest end. It's his first battle face to face with Boney. Boney and Nosy. Nosy and Boney. I wonder if they're both aware of it. There go Picton's Highlanders, moving into position. First 95th should be there somewhere. 
probably in or near Le Hay Saint. That should be the Charleroi Road. Yes, it is. My God, the mud! Hope old chap doesn't cast a shoe. That looks like Alex Gordon. They're good. Hello, Harry. What brings you here? I need a word with your governor. Go ahead. Harry Smith, your grace. Hello, Smith. Where are you from? Uh, Sixth Division, General Lambert, your grace. What have you got? The 4th, 27th in the Skillens, and the 40th with the 81st in reserve. Ah, uh, how are they? Excellent, your grace. Very strong. Good, good. Now, tell General Lambert I'm putting the hand of variants who are new to the game under his command, and tell him when I give the order, and not before, to bring his division up to the left of General Picton, because, if I'm not mistaken, that's where you're going to be needed. Is that clearly understood? Yes, quite clear, sir. Oh, God! What was that? <laughs> A shell. Very animating. Indeed. Now, uh, do you know La Haye Sand, where your first battalion is? I know where it is, sir. Oh, there's a tree on the other side of the road opposite the farm. That's where I shall be. Look, Marco. There's old Nosey under his tree again, and he's having a deco through his spy glass. Well, you better be careful, Billy. You might want to know where that cold partridge came from. Here. Pass of him, Blanc. Oh, my word. Drinking on duty, Pongo. You wanna wanna be losing them stripes again, would ya? Captain Kincaid of the 95th Rifles. Our battalion was in a large sand pit with the object of defending the western flank of an important feature in the centre of our line, the farmhouse and buildings of La Haye Sand. Boney was a bit late in starting on the morning of the 18th of June, but when he did, I had been in a number of battles in the peninsula, but never had I heard so much noise, nor seen so much shot and shell at any given time as at about 11.30 o'clock, when we were near Waterloo. Major Harry Smith. How the Commander-in-Chief knew so exactly what was to befall us will always remain a mystery. But doubtless that's where greatness lies. Indeed, battle had not been joined more than two hours when the Belgian and Dutch troops to the left of Sir Thomas Picton fled in total disarray. Our 6th Division immediately received the order to advance and fill the gap. It was at this time a sergeant and three troopers of Punsonby's dragoons, covered in mud and blood, galloped past us going to the rear. For a moment, my heart sank. Could it be that our cavalry were also in retreat? But then, as they passed General Lambert, the sergeant raised high a newly captured French eagle, and a great hurrah went up from the Enniskillens. Captain Howell Grono of the Foot Guards. I was absent without leave from duty at St. James's Palace, and had, as a result of a bet, managed to attach myself as a supernumerary to General Picton's staff. At about two o'clock, Marshal Ney, with his first corps formed in four columns, advanced in echelon. They completely put to flight a Dutch-Belgian brigade and attacked Picton's division. It was then that that noble soldier was killed by a musket ball. Soon afterwards, a senior member of his staff called me over and said, Grono, there's nothing for you here. I think you'd better go and join your own regiment, or you may get in a scrape for being absent without leave. The French threw their full weight on our centre, at La Haye Sainte and General Allen's division to the east of it. And there was a moment when I could clearly distinguish Marshal Ney dancing about like a monkey, trying to animate his men. We held them off, but at a terrible cost. Our colonel wounded, likewise our second in command, and many of the subalterns. Of eye company officers, I was the only one left standing up, though my poor horse was separated from one of his ears and had his hide punctured in two places. The worst damage to our square was done by the massed French artillery. When their heavy cavalry finally attacked, the ground was so sodden that they could scarce move faster than a trot, and being unable to penetrate our wall of bayonets, all they could do was ride around us brandishing their sabres and shouting abuse. I thought, thank God Juanita is safe and sound in Antwerp. When my horse Chiquito bolted, we were about six miles from Brussels on the Antwerp road. 
It was not Chiquito's fault. I had not gathered him up properly. When two British officers galloped by saying, the battle is lost, the French are coming. I knew at that moment that Enrique was dead because he would have been in the thick of the fight. Frightened by the other horses, Chiquito bolted. After many miles, there was a cart overturned on the road. Chiquito reared, but I managed to get hold of the curb brain at last. But I was alone, with no money, no waste, and little idea of where I was. The charges of the French cavalry were in appearance very formidable. The very earth shook under the enormous weight of men and horses. But in reality, they were a relief, since their artillery could not fire on us. At four o'clock, our square was a perfect hospital, being full of the dead, dying and mutilated. The battle had been going since about 10 o'clock in the morning. I was with my regiment, the 43rd, at the right of the line. In the late afternoon, I well remember the dread sight of the whole Guard Imperial in their tall bearskins advancing en masse in a last attempt to win the day before nightfall. But the foot guards on our left stood firm, despite fearful casualties. Then, John Coburn, our colonel, had an inspiration. Moving us at speed, for which we as light infantry had been trained, we outflanked the Guard Imperial as they engaged with our men and poured such a deadly fire into their exposed flank that all but the bravest broke and ran. What did it matter what happened to me if my Enrique was dead? But I had to know, to find his body if need be. So, I turned Chiquito's head to where I thought the battlefield must be. It had been hard pounding all day. By early evening, I noticed between two French cavalry charges, the Duke, accompanied by his aide, Colonel Alexander Gordon, enter our square. After sitting calmly for a while on his favorite charger, observing all that was taking place, he turned to Gordon and said, if the Prussians come soon, the day is mine. Then he added, what o'clock is it? Gordon took out his timepiece and was about to reply when a stray bullet knocked him to the ground, from which he was never more to rise. By the time I left Brussels behind me, I seemed to be the only person going towards the sound of gunfire. Thousands of men, mostly wounded, accompanied by gun carriages, limbers, carts and horses, were all moving slowly towards the city. I stopped by some walking wounded of the 44th Regiment in General Pike's Brigade and asked them for news of Brigade Major Smith. I knew what reply to expect. Brigade Major Smith, they said, had been killed at the same time as General Picton. Some time after five o'clock, General Lambert sent me down to the sand pit to extricate the 95th if necessary. I passed by my old 13 platoon where Sergeant Prickett told me their new officer, just out from England, was dead. As were a number of old Peninsula men. And, Prickett added, bomb-proof Palmer's going to do a die on us. No, he bloody ain't, gasped that poor fellow. It was evidently his last breath. The light was beginning to go when we saw the Duke, quite by himself, Gordon was dying and Fitzroy had lost an arm, coming down the line. He raised his hat and said something, which, being now quite deaf from exposure to so much noise all day, I could not hear. He raised his hat and spoke. These were his very words. Guards, get up and charge. charge!
The battle was over. It was quite dark by the time we bivouacked somewhere in the neighborhood of La Belle Alliance, which had been Boney's headquarters during the day. Sitting by a fire, I was thinking tenderly of Juanita, contenting myself with the thought that, though miles away, she was safe in the hands of West and Jenny Cochran. I arrived at the battlefield as daylight was fading. I was alone and friendless on a tired horse that had carried me close on 60 miles since dawn that day. Neither of us had had any food, nor had I any money. Now all I could see was a sight so terrible that all hope of finding the body of my darling husband among so many quite vanished from me. In that moment of total despair, I remembered to do one thing I had sinfully failed to do all day. I started to pray. I prayed for help to God, to our Lord Jesus Christ, and to Christ's Holy Mother who is one with God. I was thus praying when I thought I heard someone calling me. Juanita? Juanita Smith? Who is it calls me? Why, it's William Napier. Don't you remember me? Yes. Yes, my Napier. But what in the name of goodness are you doing here? I... I was praying. Praying for guidance. And you have come to help me. Thanks be to God! Oh, oh there now. <gasps> It'll be a privilege to help you, Juanita. Just tell me what I can do. Help me to find my Enrique. Hmm? Harry? Oh, that shouldn't be too difficult. Sixth Division have moved up to La Belle Alliance. But he is dead. Huh? I asked some men who knew. They told me Brigade Major Smith was dead. Oh, <sighs> that would be General Pax Brigade Major. <sighs> Poor Smith who spells his name with a Y. No, upon my honor, your Harry I've seen less than an hour ago. Not a scratch on him. Come with me. <sighs> Harry Smith! Anybody seen Major Smith? Yes, I'm here. <gasps> Who's that? William Napier. Oh, hello, Napier. Come and take a swig of brandy. And, uh, who's that with you? Enrique! Juanita! What the hell are you doing here? Enrique! <laughs> The last word must go to the hero of the day, who, for some, is still the greatest hero of any day. To the Right Honourable the Lord Bathurst, my lord, it gives me the greatest satisfaction to assure your lordship that the army never upon any occasion conducted itself better than on the field of Waterloo. Damnation, take it. How can I bring myself to write such cant? Dear Bathurst, together with my official dispatch, I am writing this personal note to you. Thank God I do not know what it is to lose a battle, but certainly nothing can be more painful than to gain one with the loss of so many friends. An historical postscript, Harry ended his distinguished career as General Sir Harry Smith, Governor of Cape Colony. But to the young girl he rescued from the siege of Badahoth came even greater fame. Juanita gave her name to a small town in South Africa which will forever be remembered for another siege, this time in the Boer War, a town called Ladysmith. In The Long Road to Waterloo, the second of two linked plays by Peter Luke based on his own novel, The Other Side of the Hill, Michael Pennington played Lord Wellington, John Moffat, Major William Napier, Dominic Rickards, Major Harry Smith, Cyril Jenkins, Juanita, Philip Sully, Don Julian Sanchez, June Tobin, Madre Soledad, and David March as Goya. Major Fitzroy Somerset was played by Christopher Good. Captain Alexander Gordon, David Bannerman, 
Rifleman West, Eric Allen, Sergeant Prickett, Ronald Herdman, Rifleman Doubleday, Clarence Smith, Rifleman Jackman and Captain Freer, Mark Straker, Rifleman Palmer, Neil Roberts, Captain Kincaid, Terence Edmund. Captain Sula, Captain Dan Cardo, and Captain Grano, Alan Barker. General Skerritt and Colonel Ponsonby, Brett Usher. Quartermaster General Scovell and Oriana, Charles Millam. Corporal Costello, Andrew Winkert. Jenny Cochran, Susan Sheridan. General Pakenham and General Vandeleur, Colin McFarlane. Harriet Wilson, Melanie Hudson. Sister Rosario and Fanny, Teresa Stratfield, Victoria, Emma Fielding. The music was composed and conducted by Tom Eastwood and performed by Paul Archibald, Richard Benjafield, Adrian Brett, Charles Dickey, Bill Worrell and Simon Weinberg. The Other Side of the Hill was directed by Glyn Dearman.